We got a show, we got a lot to cover, but I just have one question before we begin. I want you to raise your hand if you like Shohei Otani. I mean, I like Shohei. I don't know where this is going. Why well, should we not like Shohei Otani? Oh, not there's, like just, Shohei? there's some fans in the YouTube comments that think you guys despise him, and I've been trying to stick up for you guys because I'm like, uh, I don't think you're watching our show. I'm the number the one Shohei year. fan. True. I no, no. Guess. There's another guy. His brother pitches in the big leagues. That's True. way bigger fan than you are. But Ben's got you beat. Ben Verlander has you crushed you in that level. <laughs> but still, would you take number two, Kratz? Would I take number two of what? Fan. Show, show yeah. him. Yeah. Every guest. Yeah. Every guest. I'd come on and be like, "Hey, who was who should have been the best player in the MLB? Acuna or Otani? Me and Otani, we're together. We're boys." Oh, that's true. I forgot that whole thing. Well, everyone yeah. forgets about all of that. They say, tell him he doesn't have to speak. He had the world's most complicated surgery. You guys are criticizing him on the field, saying he's bragging. I'm like, I don't see any of But there were there were a couple. Wait, when did we brag on I don't know. There were a couple that jumped in because I, I like would just put on some of the comments, uh, um, what? And then like there were some that would jump in like, what are these people talking about? I'm like, I don't know, but have I don't think seen, they watch our show that often. Have you ever watched often. South Park? Yes, when but they, not many of them. Have you ever seen the one where they need a new school mascot because PETA comes after them and they're the cows and they're like, they need a new mascot? And they make them vote and the two choices are giant douche and turd sandwich. <laughs> Those are what the kids have to vote on, right? Like, this is what I feel like. Neither, like, what are the, like, wh- what are we talking about here? Like, this is not... We're the biggest baseball and Otani fan. We want him to speak more because we want to hear more about him. Yeah. I want to know more about the guy. It's not because yes. it's not that we don't like him. It's that we I want to hear more from him. I want to know more about his life and what he goes through and how he does it. I we will tune nothing. in for that. Yes, same. What about his performance on the field, Todd Father? Do you think he's good at baseball? I think he's the best. <laughs> there's no there's no doubt about it. When he's fully healthy, he is the best baseball player in Major League Baseball all over the world. It's He's a unicorn, man. He's a guy that I love, you love, we all love, and he only can help baseball. So if you don't like somebody like that, we got, we got some problems. Exactly. Perfect. Okay, that's it. Just wanted to clear that up for everyone. Hopefully our little YouTube lovers can appreciate that obviously 99 percent of them are great but some are just putting some weird things out there and you know we're for the people so i like to respond to that so subscribe to the channel by the way too as we're pushing 40k on the subs here and same on the podcast crowd if you are on spotify or on apple and you're like damn i don't know when a new pod gets released there's a notification button so you can hit that too if you want to see when the next ft pod gets released And a reminder to everyone that if you'd like to meet us in person and you are in the Bay Area, then we will be at Fans Fest in Oakland. I'm excited about it. There it is. February 24th, we announced it yesterday. We'll unveil more details as it gets closer. You can obviously check out Last Eye Bar, Oakland 68s, etc., all of their content and see who else will be in attendance. It is going to be a party. Do we have the City Connects for Oakland? I feel like it's worth showing them. Did you see those? The fake city connects. Mm, no. Yeah, that's great. Oh Jesus, <laughs> that looks like the minor league city connects. <laughs> that looks like the little league world series jerseys Todd it wore does. back in the day. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Somewhere west, they are somewhere west. I just, I, I mean, I know we dug into Oakland a lot yesterday, but I, I, I hope that. Fisher has to go groveling back to the city of Oakland. Like that's please, today. Pl- I know. Please, please let us stay. And they only pay one point two million dollars to play there for the whole year. That's an easy rent. Ludicrous. He's not at the meeting though. I think it's only Caval who's the guy who he controls. But if I'm if city I'm, officials, if I'm, I'm, Cabal, like, I'm like you have to come. Oh, if I'm Caval, I'm like I want Fisher. I want him in the building. I want him in the room. Well, Caval's the president. You're saying he wants his boss there. 
If I'm the A's, I'm telling Caval, I want Fisher there. Hmm. I, I want Fisher there. I want He's Fisher fired. in these meetings. No, no, I'm I'm saying I'm if I'm the city, not Caval, I'm saying I'm the oh, city. Oh, I, oh. I, I want Fisher in that meeting, in that room, because I want to hear it from him. Because nobody's got anything from him except for whatever the hell he said the other day, which in didn't Vegas. make sense at the time. Yeah, he was he, he has need some coaching on speaking. All right, let's charge the damn mounds because we do have some concerns to address. Mm. And they come from Sarasota, which is where the Baltimore Orioles do their spring training. And we learned about a whole laundry list of injuries at a camp this morning. But the one that really has us on red alert is Kyle Bradish. Todd Father, this is one of the best pitchers in the sport last year. Obviously, he's young. Yep. That was really his breakout last year. UCL sprain. He's going to start the season on the injured list. He's starting throwing progressions tomorrow. This is Andy Koska who covers the team. And Mike Elias said they expect him to pitch in 2024. And I'll add on. Elias didn't give any timeline, and a quote from him was, the earlier returns are very encouraging. Everything is in a really good spot right now. We're prepping him for a lot of action in 2024. This sucks. This, this is one of the breakout candidates from last year. I think he had the best second half ERA in the American League, and you were hoping to slot him in number two after Mr. Burns. Yeah, and anytime you hear UCL, it's like, Oh, boy, it's kind of that tinkering spot where it could be something big. It could be something not as big. But for him, all signs are pointing good. I mean, I, you know, you hear about guys coming back from those things and be able to pitch a lot during the season. But here's spring training. You get down there, and all of a sudden, there's some things going on. It happens every spring, it seems like. Somebody's hurt. And now there's actually a couple more injuries that you're going to talk about with this team. So what looked to be – uh you know, very nice thing. They got a couple pickups with Burns and all these guys. Um, I'm not saying they're out of the water yet. I'm just saying, you know, here we go. Bite, nail biting time right now. I know they got time, but still, it's a little nail biting time. Don't ever get any pictures of any parts of your ligaments, joints, anything, unless it's serious. Because you're going to find something wrong. AJ, who never was on the I.L., they're going to find something wrong in there. It's not, it's just, it's not good when you get pictures now that's lingering. Cause there's always, there's always something. A sprain is a small tear. How small of a tear only doctors can tell only the reader of the picture can tell, but you just, you don't want to see it. You don't want to hear about it, but starting his throwing progression is a positive for the Orioles. This guy, this is a big blow. No matter what, how much he missed. He was fourth in the MLB in ERA. Last year, 283 is 1.04 whip, was third best in the major leagues. Like, this is a good dude. He was 12 and 7, 30 starts last year. This is a big deal. And the Burns trade now is even bigger than, in, than what we had previously thought what it was going to be. But the other problem is John Means is behind schedule. We talked about Verlander being behind. John Means is behind schedule. So that's two of their five, you know, projected starters. And then the one on the bottom there, Gunnar Henderson has oblique aggravation. Not a concern. Listen, as someone that tore their oblique, it's always yep. a concern. Because once you hurt it, it doesn't, like, go away overnight. Like, you no. can't do anything. You can't walk. You can't talk. You can't breathe. It hurts to do anything. God forbid you have to, like, sneeze or cough because then you're, you you want to cry. But, I mean, just because it's aggravated. I mean, I know there's still six weeks or so to opening day, but this – this is some big things that they're having to deal with already in Orioles camp. And this is why you can never have too much pitching. This is why you can never have too much, too many position players and not have enough depth in your organization. But the Orioles are going to be tested here. And I can't wait to hear what Ken has to say about this because he's a, he's an Orioles guy for true and true. Well, we're already getting flooded in the chat with people wondering if the Orioles are going to instantly react. I mean, Dylan sees here he comes. They have the prospect capital to easily pull off a deal and bring in another starter. I know you're shaking your head, Kratz, but don't you think it's easier to pull off deals now? Of course, free agent deals, if you have the money. I don't think they're going to go down that route for the top end guys, but for trades, no? Yesterday was the day before they announced it. Nobody needed to know. If you're adding guys, I mean, maybe they knew about this Braddish elbow. Hey, my elbow's kind of barking. Get on the horn with the Brewers. What do they want? Like, that maybe, maybe, like, they knew about this. Today wasn't the first day that they found out about 
yep. oblique injury, John Means being behind. They knew about it. Today's just the first day that they were they needed to announce it. Very true. I All agree. Right, well. So does this mean Sneller Montgomery's back on the board for them? That's what I was making a trade. I mean, what about one of those two big name guys? That sale needs to get finalized before they really start doing this. Maybe not. Maybe not. You're right. Because it's basically a done deal. You know what? Let's bring in Junior. Junior. Insider Ken Rosendahl joining us right now on the Orioles injuries. Ken, fans are already buzzing. Will the Orioles immediately respond to a situation like this via trade or signing? Immediately, I don't know, but I would expect that they would be at least checking in on some of the free agent starters still remaining. And I'm not just talking about Blake Snell and Jordan Montgomery. As you said, Scott, those two are probably outside of their reach until the ownership change takes place. Is it possible David Rubenstein could tell John Angelos and Mike Elias, go ahead, do it now? Yes, but even then, I don't know if the Orioles are spending at that level. But there are other starting pitchers available. Michael Lorenzen is one. Eric Lauer is another. Clevenger is a third. And those are just three, and there are others still. And the shame of this is, obviously, from the Orioles' perspective, you don't want to be in this position. But in general, in spring training, once the camp's open, this kind of stuff starts happening. And that's why if you're Scott Boris and you're sitting there with Montgomery and Snell, you're going to be okay. Bellinger and Chapman, who knows, maybe one of them has to take a shorter deal, maybe not. But the pitchers, they're always going to be in demand. Injuries happen. That's how Josh Hader got to Houston when Kendall Gravely went down. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this all evolves. Dylan Cease, I don't expect, would be a factor for them. It seems like the White Sox are intent on just opening the season with him. And the price was rather high, as it should be for a pitcher with two years of control. But I would expect... Given the Braddish news, given the concern over means, yes, that they would look to get some depth for sure. As it stands today, no no looking ahead in the future, as the injuries have been told, which is the most serious? Means, Braddish, or or Gunner? Braddish. Anytime you hear of a UCLA sprain, a UCL sprain, excuse me, that is a huge concern. It could be a precursor to a Tommy John surgery. You don't know. I don't want to speculate irresponsibly, but a UCL injury is always a concern. And my understanding from the early reports is that he's going to try to pitch through it and rehab and do it that way. We see that that doesn't always work. So obviously we all wish him only the best. He was arguably the best pitcher in baseball besides Blake Snell the second half of last season. And he was a huge part of what they did, and it was a, is a huge part of what they will do going forward. But right now, there is significant concern there, sure. What? Okay, there's, this is kind of a two-part question. When is it – let's say Braddish tries to pitch, and how long do you give it? Because I, the only guy I can remember that really did this was uh, Tanaka in the, with the Yankees. Every other guy that's tried this, they end up having Tommy John anyways. So how long are they going to give this? And then, let's say, God forbid, a month from now, two months from now, this doesn't work. Then will they go out and try to make a trade for a Bieber or Cease or, or someone else, if there's anyone else available out there? Because it seems like, you know, I know they have depth and they, ha- they have all these prospects, but it's hard to replace a guy like Braddish. Absolutely. Now, they can give it a little bit because of the timeline in recovering from Tommy John surgery. It's what, 12 to 18 months, right? And you usually prefer to be on the longer side. So if, for instance, he has the surgery next week, he's probably looking at, back, looking at coming back at some point late next season. I don't know how long you can wait given that. And that's the problem here, that you don't want to take him out just for this season and next season as well. Let's say you have this done June 1st. Well, he's missing the rest of this season and probably next season too. So... I correct myself. It is something that they're going to have to decide on. I would expect somewhat quickly. And listen, if he can pitch with it, as Tanaka did successfully for many years, there was a different injury, I believe. There was a small tear with Tanaka. I don't know that the Braddish injury is being described quite the same way. But if you can pitch with it, fine. It just seems to me like these things generally end one way and not in a good way. Maybe, Ken, maybe uh, he can have the super secret surgery that Otani had and not tell anybody what it is and then just come back miraculously. You're going to get yelled at for saying that. <laughs> I'm just saying. 
<laughs> well, there are different forms of. No, I know. There's bracing. I know. I know kids. I know kids have. Bra- yeah. I, I know a kid that had the Tommy John the bracing brace. thing. Where, what? Yes. Yeah, where instead of the full Tommy John, he just had his arm braced. And I know people that have obviously had the full zipper. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh, it just sucks. It only does suck for the Orioles. It just sucks for baseball because you want the best I, players out there. It just sucks. And AJ, I'm totally with you on that. And I was saying the other day, man, once camp's open, guys are going to start getting hurt, and the free agent thing's going to change. And I said that because I know it to be true, but saying it, it was painful to say. You don't want this to ever happen to anybody. You want to see the best players on the field. You want to see guys in good health. They have short careers. You guys know this. Your career only lasts so long, and to see you miss time or any player miss time, it's difficult. It's difficult for fans, for people, of course, running the teams, for the players themselves. It's just unfortunate. Yeah, and unfortunately, in this case, most of the time, it's this is what happens. The UCL announcement happens, the PRP, and eventually it does lead to surgery. Not always, but more often than not, covering the sport for a while, we, we see this result. So last one on this is Michael Elias saying that he felt it when he started throwing in January. So then everyone starts to get a little more curious. Do you think that helped to lead to the deal for Corbin Burns as well? And you know, I still have my conspiracy theory about the owner, Rubenstein, who I actually heard on on Bloomberg TV yesterday, because it's like basically done. And it just sounds like, you know, he's kind of operating behind the scenes until he gets the formal approval from owners, which he said should be very soon. Scott, they needed Corbin Burns in November. They needed him in December. They needed him in January. They needed him in February, regardless of Kyle Bradish's situation. Obviously, I think, as AJ said earlier, the fact that Burns is there now is comforting in some degree. It gives them the ace that they wanted to acquire all along, and now you have some questions behind him. But I would expect, and I do know this, that they were trying to get Corbin Burns in December. And they thought maybe then it could happen, but Milwaukee apparently didn't want to do it then. So I don't really believe in the Rubenstein ghost theory that he was operating behind the scenes and ordering them to do it because they were trying to do it. At the same time, it gets interesting now. How do you deal with this? And can Rubenstein say, or will he say, and does he have the authority to say when he's not yet approved hey, let's go. Let's do some things here. I'm not exactly sure how that works. I'm sure he can say things. He can always say things. But it's like buying a house. Until it's closed, you don't want to do anything to the house, right? So it's kind of the same idea. So you were at Royals camp yesterday, right or wrong? Right. Birthday boy I was. I oh, appreciate that. Thank delayed. you very much, dude. <laughs> but what did you see over there, man? They made a lot of acquisitions. Um, they're looking like a team that if they come together, they'll be a pretty, pretty darn good team. In my opinion, uh, talk to us about what you saw all over there and what you expect. They're excited. And I know every team is excited at this time of year. It's just the way it is. It's kind of the beauty of spring training, but they've added a lot. Seth Lugo and Michael Waka and Adam Frazier and Hunter Renfro and Will Smith and Chris Stratton. It's six free agents right there. It's a pretty good group. Garrett Hampson is a seventh. So what they've done is brought in some veteran presence and some accomplished players. Lugo and Waka were really good starters for San Diego last year. And they're strike throwers. The Royals wanted that. They need that. And with the Witt extension, there is excitement in that camp that is a little bit different than it's been in the past because they've brought in these guys – Let's face it, the AL Central is a weak division. It is a division that, in theory, a team could jump up and at least challenge the Twins. Maybe the Royals are that team. Maybe the Tigers are that team. Maybe the Guardians are good again, even though they haven't done a whole lot. So it's going to be an interesting division. But yes, they have in that camp some optimism. And it's kind of refreshing to see because, of course, Kansas City has been in kind of a building mode for several years now. Ken, a couple things on the Royals. One, who's who's the next player that the White Sox are going to sign from the Royals since they <laughs> seem to get all of them, especially usually once they're a little bit old. And, the front off, and their front office also. So, I mean, they're just they're just going to stack them up out here uh, over a couple miles down the road for me. And then second of all, with the Bobby Witt extension, you kind of touched on it, but is there just more enthusiasm in camp 
that, hey, we can do this. We can keep our guys. And also, I don't know if you got to see any fans, if there was fans around or people around, just the, the, the excitement in general from what they did with the Bobby Witt extension. It kind of changes the game plan and the new stadium coming. Well, there weren't many people around, but you make a great point, AJ. And both things that you just mentioned, the Witt extension and the possibility of a new stadium, and they released the artist renderings the other day, ahead of Oakland, by the way. And those, th- those two things together, combined with what they've done this winter, it creates a palpable sense of excitement around that franchise that there really hasn't been for a long time. So, yes, it's really a good time in the Royals' evolution here. I'm not saying that they're going to be great this year. Pakoda has them for 70 wins. Fangraphs has them for 76, still finishing fourth. And obviously those projection systems aren't always right, but they generally are based on, they aren't based on the talent that is on paper with the team. So I don't know if they'll be good, but they have a chance to take a step forward. If you look at the rotation now, it's Waka and it's Lugo. It's Jordan Lyles coming back. It's Cole Riggins, who was one of the best pitchers in baseball the second half of last season after arriving in that trade for Chapman with the Rangers. And there's Brady Singer, who still has all this promise, and maybe this year will be a bounce-back year for him. So there is a lot to be excited about. The bullpen's been remade. Nick Anderson's coming over there. He came in a trade, cash considerations. Wasn't a big deal, but Nick Anderson, a few years back when he was healthy, was pretty darn good. You look at all these pieces, and you say, okay, maybe. Now, of course, you have to always say at this time of year, The caveat is it's early in spring and things will happen, and we all know that. But as you try to paint a picture of what this team can be, it's a little easier to see them as a potential contender now than it was before. At least they're trying. At least they're they're trying, trying, which which is great for baseball, whether it's because they want a new stadium or not. But a team that is most likely going to sell now because he said he's not going to sell The Angels not only are saying – Artie Moreno said he's not going to sell, but that they're cutting payroll. Is this like – like, is this one and the same? Is this – the like, is is there – should we be reading more in between the lines of what Artie said yesterday? I don't know that we should be reading more into it, Eric, but certainly there's a lot to unpack there. And Sam Blum of The Athletic wrote a really good column this morning – basically asking all of the questions. And of course, Artie didn't talk to Sam. He talked to Jeff Fletcher from the Orange County Register, but that's not what Sam's column was about. Sam's column was about the fact that the Angels have all of these different issues. Their spring training site was supposed to be overhauled in the last three years. It hasn't been yet. They're basically in a minor league clubhouse. They have a stadium lease that expires in 2028 with extensions through 38. That's unresolved. He has always wanted, already has a land deal along with a stadium renovation. We don't know where that is. And from the team on the field itself, there are all kinds of questions. What is their vision? Where are they going with this? Are they just going to patch every year with Mike Trout? Not a great idea. Hasn't worked. So, the questions that I'm posing here are posed much more eloquently by Sam in this column, and I encourage people to read it. And really, when you look at that franchise, you just wonder, what is the future? And at what point, and I know we've asked this before, and I know I'm sure he gets tired of hearing it, but at what point does Mike Trout say, hey, you know what, enough of this? And he hasn't said it yet. He's a guy who wants to be like his boyhood idol, Derek Jeter, and play his whole career with one team. But I would suggest that every player has a limit. Maybe he hasn't reached it yet, but at some point you wonder if Mike Trout says enough. Now, part of that is he's got to stay healthy and perform the way we know Mike Trout can in order to raise his trade value again. But it's just a lingering cloud over this franchise, his future. I was, I was literally going to ask that same question, but it's got to be a team where you just say, hey, I want, I want, to, I want out. And it's still got to be a team where he feels like he can win for one. And, a te- you know, he's got the no trade clause in some of those. So it's like, where would he go and who would want him if that was the case? Well, I don't know, Todd. And yeah. trying to be respectful to Mike here, I know fans say, how can you stay at this t- with this team? They're losers. They don't win. How do you want to be there? 
when they're just not competitive in a way that you would want Mike Trout to be. Players, and you guys know this, have all different reasons for wanting to be in certain spots and all different reasons for their choices of teams once they have the choice. So I'm not about to condemn him for this. I don't think it makes him less of a competitor or anything like that. That is bogus. But I do wonder why at this point he isn't getting frustrated, if indeed he isn't. It's something maybe I'll ask him when I see him. I know he's been asked it before, and I know he doesn't like the question all that much. I wouldn't either if I were him. But, hey, where is this vision here? What is the vision? What is going to happen for this team two years, five years, ten years? We have no answers. Ken, remember last year, before the season ended, I when they didn't trade Shohei, I, I said, he needs to sit down with Artie this, off, this offseason and, and – and, not make it public. Just go to Artie and say, look, man, what, what you just said, what's the vision? Where are we going? And then Todd, who knows Mike way better, and even Kratz were like, he's not that type of person. He'd never do it. So I get it. I mean, he wants to win with the Angels. But they're just – what the biggest thing that I take away from what you said is where's the vision? They're supposed to do the spring training thing. They haven't done it. It still sucks. They're still in tents and doing all that stuff outside, like right, like back when I was coming up, right? They, they haven't really done anything to Anaheim, to the Angels Stadium either. I mean, it's still the same from 25 years ago. It looks very similar. Everything is the same. So what is the vision in Anaheim? And why the heck won't Artie Moreno just be like, hey, I'll take my $3 billion and get the heck out of here and go do something else? The answer to that last question is probably because he just likes owning the team. And he certainly had the it's chance choice. to sell. No, it was his choice. He had the chance to sell, backed out, or backed off, and chose not to. I don't know why he doesn't have more of a vision, or at least doesn't share more of a vision. This is a team that is, in theory, one of the jewel franchises. It's not the Dodgers or the Yankees. I get it, but it plays in the Los Angeles market. It has a rich, proud history, like most teams do, and they just seem to be spinning their wheels. That would be the best way I could describe it, because every year they bring in these mid-level free agents, They do some things. It's all patchwork. And they have enough talent where if in a given year you hit on enough of these guys, you're going to contend. It is possible. But it's a thin margin for error. And they rarely seem to get to a point where that margin for error isn't overwhelming them. Um, Ken, we appreciate the time. We'll let him jump. Uh, He's got to get somewhere. Does he? That's right. Uh, Yeah. I'm getting somewhere. Yeah, he is. Go for it, Ken. Go I'm training. Go and but, go. Yeah, know, but by camps. the way, before you before you go somewhere, I, we got to give you props because the other day we asked you about Wheeler, and then it came out to, that today they started mm-hmm. discussion. So you said he was most likely to get extended. So for once in my life, I doff my cap to you, Junior. Oh, I am honored. Hey, I wanted to say something too. So I've been researching because this is the kind of stupid stuff I do. Who are the best? Number 34 overall picks have been in the last 20 years. And the reason I looked this up, because Corbin Burns, one of the players that went back for him, is not a player yet, but was the 34th pick in, or will be the 34th pick in this year's draft. That's one of the things the Brewers got. The best 34th pick of the last 20 years, Todd Frazier. Mm. Ooh, let's go. Oh, wow. My guy is feeling it right here. Feeling it. <laughs> All right, I'll go with him. I'll see you guys later. That was great. <laughs> so, man, I give you, you the so compliment. Much, you compliment hey. Todd. I'm taking it back. I take it back. All of a sudden, I'm <laughs> just <laughs> actually a lot happier now. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Ken. That was a great note to leave us with. Appreciate you. See you soon. Todd Father. The, uh, the best. Brewers I, just I, got I was themselves speechless. a Todd Father. I didn't know what to say. I was speechless. <laughs> <laughs> that that That's doesn't good. happen too often. Uh, what about... Spring training at minor league camps. How often does that happen for four years? I'm curious. Because you know how Kratz players will come up with things and reasons really why you know they'd rather sign with Team A than Team B if the money is the same and often players get similar offers. You know, playing time's a factor. If you're a pitcher, the environment, the defense might be a factor. What about not having a major league spring training camp? Does that matter to players? If you're comparing apples to apples, if you get $1.5 million from two teams 
and they tell you, uh, by the way, you know, our weight room is in a tent and connected to the tent is another tent where we eat our meals. That's a long, that's a tough six weeks. That's a tough six weeks in Tempe. And I, I don't, I don't think it needs to be like the Diamondbacks boot ranch or what Diamondbacks Rockies facility, which is ridiculous, but it can't be a tent. Like we got, we got to figure that out. Four years. He said, yeah, he's been saying they've been going to redo it. The now they're going to redo it that. next time. The well, the Cardinals, been... Cardinals said that the Cardinals said that and they, they didn't do theirs either, which I found odd because the Cardinals and the Marlins were on it. The Roger Dean down in Jupiter and they didn't do it either. So I don't know what, they're, they're, they'll get theirs done, though. That's yeah. a difference. Also, that that's a one-year delay? Yeah. Very, uh, did you guys – Very humbling. <laughs> true. Did you guys – I don't know about I don't know about you, Kratz, but, Todd, did, like, for me, my last year, I had other offers, and I was like, I'm playing – and every team was like, we know he's going back to Atlanta. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going back to Atlanta because spring training was here. Mm. So I had a 15-minute drive every day. I picked my kids up from school. I mean, it was great. I mean, I, they'd go on the road, and I could be home by 11 a.m., and I'm like, this is awesome. I can do whatever I want. I can go play golf. I'm at home. I'm at my home course, you know? So, like, people that say, oh, it doesn't matter. If you're from Arizona and you have a chance to sign with a team in Arizona for spring or yeah. a team in Florida, you're going to take the Arizona. Like, for me, I was like, oh, I can stay in Florida? And being from Florida, even, like, when I went to the Red Sox when you're in Fort Myers, it's like two and a half hours. So I would request to go on the road. I'd come home the night before and then meet the team in Tampa and then just drive home after I played like things like that. It it matters. It's six or seven weeks of, especially when you have kids and you have young kids and you know, like my kids are in school and you're gone. It sucks, man. So it matters. Mm -hmm. That stuff matters. Facilities matter. Location matters. All that stuff matters. Yeah, I, I wish there was a team around here that wanted me in my last couple of years. <laughs> not, not yeah, but you had a nice little New York run, Todd Father. Yeah, at yeah, least you were about close. three and a half years. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was really good. You had some Yanks, some Mets. I mean, obviously, it's not super close, but it's it's close, right? I mean, a few no, hours. That was, that was fine. Yeah, I had a nice apartment in in Fort Lee, right by the GW, and um, took me twelve minutes to get to the Yankees, and then about twenty five to get to the Mets. So. Not bad. I did, it, I did it for my wife and kids. So after the game, like even if they didn't come, they, it's only an hour drive home and they can hang out, you know? Yeah. It matters. Of course. That makes sense. Especially for the vets too, right? Like if you've been in the league for a while, you've yeah. made some money. And and we've talked about this many times. For for a big star, it's different, but that's on the free agent market, maybe for the first time, like a Sneller Montgomery. But often the offers are very similar, almost eerily similar mm-hmm. sometimes. They use the same model projections and they spit out offers. How many times have you talked to a vet where he's like, no one called me. And then on December 20th, I got five calls for the same offer. Haven't you heard that before? It yes. happened to me. It happened to you? You get the same number and you're like, this is weird. The two teams are out, two or three teams are offering the exact same number. How do they get, How do they, like, what are they all sitting down on a computer going, yeah, we're all going to offer the – and then you're like, well, well, we have this other offer. And they're like, that's the best we can do. And all three teams, and then you're like, well, damn, how do I make this decision? And it within comes down to things. Within a two-day span, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's crazy. Hey, we, we have a vet who has signed for some dough, and he's played out in Arizona in spring training often. Mike Moustakis, a little minor league contract. AJ alluded to it. The Chicago Royals signed Moustakis <laughs> to a $2 million deal if he makes it to the big league club. Why are you laughing? What, because you said the, the Chicago Royals, which is kind of funny because everyone, oh, everyone they have is they're an ex-Royal in some way. Front mm. office. You like my dad joke? That was good. That was better than Kratz's normal dad joke. No, no. Kratz, you know Moustakis better. I think, Todd, I don't know if you played with him or not. But yeah, yep. Like, I mean, he's, been, he's always an awesome dude. My question is, where's he going to play? Their base is Moncada, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a backup plan. For how long? Well, that's the other question. I mean, for, well, what, Moncada or Moustakis? Moncada. Well, you, you got to give him a shot. I mean, they, you know, Grifol comes out every day and says oh, he's the best shape of his life. He's, you know, he wants to do it. He's also a contract year, so not saying that matters. But he's not going to play first. Andrew Vaughn's there, right? I mean, can he play the outfield? Can he play right field? No. He played some first, second. First, third, DH. 
Okay. Maybe second. DH yeah, is Eloy. Know, second, you, no. DH is Eloy. They've already said it. I understand. Third is Moncada. First is Vaughn. This team Who's is second? not the. This team has injuries. Who's their galore second with baseman? these guys. Their second baseman's Nicky Lopez. I don't think they're putting Mike Mustakis at you know no. mid thirties at second base anymore with no shift. You know you can't do the shifts the same way. Let me, let Lopez me ask you this: Vaughn at first base, you said. Yeah. Yes. He's not the tallest dude, right? No. no. He, he hit thirty he last rakes. year, didn't he? He hit thirty yeah. Yeah, last yeah. year around yeah. there. Dude, and he was a third overall pick for the White Sox. So Moose is at the good. twilight of his career, yeah, yeah, though. But, he's but, a, he's going to be a guy that can fill in at all those spots, and more than likely, is, they're going to have an injury in the first few weeks. And also, this is a – what do we talk about like with the Pirates when like certain guys sign in certain places? This is a depth piece, and if he's doing well, White Sox aren't in it, which most people don't project him to be in it. They'll trade him, and they'll try and get something for him. at the You know, whenever. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I – I, I wish, you know, I wish Moose the best. And obviously I wish the White Sox the best. And I hope he finds a place. I hope he goes out and he just rakes. And then, yep. hey, they get a good prospect for him. Well, good news. Right. We're supposed to bring him on tomorrow, right? Yeah, I was going to say, can I can I throw my friend my friend a bone? And uh, he's already coming on tomorrow. After his, well, after his workout, he's going to be on later in the show. Love right. that. Moose joining FT tomorrow. Okay. Is that his first time or did he come on before? No, he's been he on. on. He was from the dugout of Philly. Friday. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it was with you guys, right? You two yep. were on? Yep. This guy. I have a story a I have to ask him about. I want to know if it's true or not. Okay. Need it. Need it. Well, Save I'll ask it. him tomorrow. I hope it uh, – because I heard it and I want to know if it's true. Second overall pick. Mm -hmm. mm, true. All right. I want to get to this before our next guests, plural. So, first off, did you see Mike Rizzo? putting up the signs. I love that sign. I don't know if it was. I was it love definitely that Rizzo? Sign. I love that sign. Love is that sign is fucking awesome. I hope it's a nice sign, too. I hope it's like – I hope it's – yeah, like the picture. I don't need a printout. <laughs> I need that thing metallic. I need it to be a sign, like a street sign, permanently there. Read it for the podcast crowd later that will only be listening. I don't care how fast you throw ball four. Oh. Oh, wait. Todd Father, your mic's a little messy. We'll come yeah, right back little, to you. Hold on. A little cranky. A little janky. That is tremendous. We're going to reset you one second. I love, I love it, too. I love the fact that it's they're talking on both sides of their mouth, though, because they got the track man set up for every single bullpen. So they're like, I don't care how hard you throw the last one, but it is reiterating the fact that we do need strikes. We're going to track every single one of your pitches. And every number from like 70 to 93 in big league camp is like, I don't care what the sign says. I'm trying to make track man happy. Let's get this. <laughs> I, love, I know. That's what I was thinking too. Like they don't care, but yet they have track man and whatever set up on every mound watching him throw. So I, I love the sign though, because listen, as someone that helps out younger kids and tries to help them, I tell the pitchers this all the time. I don't care if you throw 90 or 80, but if you can throw it over the plate, we're going to be a lot better. So just because you throw one ball 90 and it goes off the car like A.J. Burnett did that time and breaks a window, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't you matter. The ball, great, it was 90, but it was also ball 16. He walked in a run. I mean, like, give me a guy that throws three – like, Greg Maddox was the king of this. He's like, I could throw 95, but I could also locate 91 a lot better and make it move more. I mean, yeah, velocity is great, but if you can't con – control uncontrolled velocity also can get hit and get wild. You want to see a bad team – Usually, they're going to have guys that can't throw strikes. That's what you're going to see. Actually, Todd Father, you asked about the Royals earlier. Yeah. That's the number one goal from last year to this year for KC as well. I watched quite a few Royals games. For some reason, I threw money down on Royals games pretty often. <laughs> and it was maddening watching some of those games. And they said it. I mean, their manager said it. Their GM said it. We need guys that can throw strikes. And what did they do? Every pitcher they acquired is above average in terms of strike throwing, you know, the walk rates lower than average for guys like Seth Lugo, Waka, Will Smith, et cetera. It's like, yo, Especially let's bring in some part. dudes that know how to freaking throw the ball over the plate. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like you're letting guys get on base. It's, it was so frustrating watching them sometimes. Yeah. And that goes for a couple other teams, but yeah, I mean, only time will tell. So for the Royals, I'm excited to watch them. I, I know you guys are too. So with the signings they got, kind of took the world, not the world, baseball world by storm. Like, oh, here they come. So watching these guys this year, I mean, listen, are they going to get 100 wins? Most likely not. If they do, that'd be great. But they are going to be a team that, you know, you're going to have to battle your butt off to beat them. All right. So the other 
layer of this conversation I want to ask you guys about is the curious case of Steven Strasburg. <laughs> so Stras is done as a player. His major league career is over. Doctors have said this is done. Mark Zuckerman, who covers the team for Masson, said they still want him to report to spring training and mentor his teammates. They still have a locker for him. They've kept it for him. Also keep this in mind. Th this might be kind of nerdy inside baseball league, but you get a 40-man roster and teams covet all 40 of those spots in the offseason. They have to leave a space open for Strasburg just to try and shove it to him and say, you need to show up to spring training. You know, like teams will make trades just to open up a spot. Like the Dodgers traded Caleb Ferguson to the Yankees. They had to open up a spot. Like every spot really counts. They, they want 40 talented players on that list. Strasburg's not playing. He has to be on the list till you get to spring training. Then they can put him on the 60-day IL. The shit is deep. Did you see some of the quotes from Mike Rizzo? Talking about, yeah. I mean, they, they want him they want him back. They understand he's not going to play baseball. To me, I feel like I feel like this is an owner telling the GM, hey, this is what we're going to do. We want to try to manipulate a way. To me, it looks like a manipulate a way out of this contract, which is not going to happen. But there no. must be some type of negotiation on the table because there was going to be a ceremony and everything last year. And then all of a sudden on Thursday, maybe they axed the Saturday ceremony. So there's more than we don't. There's more that we're not getting all the information here. I'll tell you what's happening. They're pissed that mm -hmm. a guy they signed. They're long being term, petty as fuck being is what petty. they are. They didn't they have insurance on him. They told him they'd do a ceremony and then they swept the rug from under him and said, just kidding, we're not doing that. But do you want to tweak your contract and then we'll do the ceremony? And he was like, no. They even took it in this story. It says to the league and to the PA and the league and the PA said, no, there's nothing wrong here. You need to figure it out if you want to try and get a settlement out of this. Players are never going to do that. That's why there are guaranteed contracts. But there's a lot of quotes here from Mike Rizzo. I mean, he said he's invited like every other guy on our 40 man roster. He's got until February 24th to be here. And yeah, I expect him to be here. He never went to West Palm beach last year for spring training. Occasionally he showed up at the park last season, but not on game days. And if you know, Steven Strasburg, I mean, I've covered him for years, not a talker. And even with teammates, he's not mean. He's just, he's very quiet. He, he's shy. If you go up to him and you want to have a combo, like I think Josiah Gray said he had, cool, but he's not going to seek guys out. He's he's not a future coach, okay? Let's put but, it that but, way. But by the way, like why do they – if he's disgruntled and he's injured, he does – why would you want someone like that around anyways? Like that's what – the part of this I don't understand is, listen, Steven Strasburg did one great thing for him. He won him – he helped win him the World Series in mm -hmm. 2019, right? That was the one year where – I mean, there was a couple other years, but that was the one year where he just balled out, was healthy the whole year, pitched a ton. They went on and rode him to the World Series, him and Scherzer, right? Howie Kendrick and, and some, uh, Soto and all. Uh, but they sure. won a World Series, right? Great. But after that, he hasn't pitched, what, 30 innings? He signed a contract, so I pitched 31 innings or 30, whatever it is, 31 and two-thirds. But why would you want this guy there? You know he's not going to pitch. Just let the guy retire, pay him off. I don't think it's insured. That's why they don't want that to happen. But – why, why why make this – this is turning into just like a pissing contest that nobody's going to win from, except Steven Strasburg, who's just like, guess what? I ain't coming. You guys know I can't pitch, so just keep sending my checks as long as they clear. So it's like the Nationals are trying to embarrass him, but he one, he doesn't talk to anybody in the media, and two, he doesn't care because those checks keep coming in every two weeks. He has to show up, though. I mean, Rizzo said, I'm not going to get into what our expect expectations of him are fully, but, yeah, be around. You're a legacy part of this franchise. Be here. Be accessible to young players. What a better guy for Cade Cavalli to lean on. Strauss has had the Tommy John, came back from TJ, pitched great after TJ. How do you rehab it? How do you prepare after rehab from it? So this guy's got a lot to offer a franchise beyond towing it up on the rubber. He's he still owed three he, years. But he doesn't 100. talk to people. He's, I mean, I'm asking you guys didn't play with him, but I've been around him a little bit. He doesn't talk to anybody. It's not like you want him going out there being like, hey, guys, this is how we tough through starts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't mean that mean. I don't mean that rudely, but I mean – I know he had Tommy John. Listen, when he came up, he was the ultimate hype prospect of all time, right? And listen, he, again, he won a World Series. He did a lot of cool things. But this, this, if you're not happy in a place and they're forcing you to do this, I mean, it takes a special person when they're not happy to, to go in and be like, hey, guys, I'm going to help everybody on the team. 
Like you're, I'm first of all, he's gonna be pissed. He lives in California. He's gonna have to go to Palm Beach. But that's that, not close to each other, dude. Like, there's people. I'll give you an example. Christian in the chat. The Nats are paying him thirty five million dollars to not play. The least he can do is show up to spring training. Mm -mm. No. Let me ask you this question: If he doesn't show up, what happens? Then there's problems. He's gonna have to show up. Him. The Nats are trying to. So build you just a have case. to show up and take a physical and prove you can't pitch. I think they just want to force him to be there as much as possible to try and convince him mm. that even if they save a million bucks or two, they feel like they've got to win. It, this is an ogre, an owner ego situation at this point, right? Yep. If you're an owner, you're pissed that you signed him and that you didn't get an insurance policy on it. I don't think insurance was passing him, right? And you want to get some type of win out of it just for your own personal satisfaction. That's what I think is happening here. They want him to say, you know what, uncle, I'm not coming. I don't want to be around this. This is not my style and I'm hurt. So I'll give you a couple million bucks back and they'll go, ha ha, we did it. We win. That's what I think. If is I'm happening. him and I'm Scott Boris, I'm like, nope. I give me all my money. Yeah. You guys say, I'm oh, sure. You know, yeah. You know what? I'd go there. I'd go to the breakers for a few days. I'd show up be like, look, I can't lift my arm. Oh, I tried to throw. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Pay me all my money. Thanks, guys. See you. See you next year in spring training. I think most guys like okay, because uh, I know what AJ would do. I know what I would do. I'm I'm a pain in the ass. Like uh, let's let's get Todd Father for example. What would you do if they're like you have to show up like and and you're hurt and and you're done. Your playing career's over. Um, and let's say you're not as vocal as you are as a person. Like, would you go there and, and kind of like mope around and be like, fuck this shit until they gave up and said, okay, fine, go home. Yeah. I mean, you, I, I mean, I would go, that's for sure. If, if there was a problem, you'd have to go. Um, what is there else for him to do? You know, you put your uniform on, put a baggie over your shirt or don't even wear a uniform, go out there and watch guys throw bullpens. All right. That was a good day. Eat some lunch. And go on home. I don't know. what. What are, I just don't know. You could say whatever you want. But Rizzo's going to have to be like, hey, listen, this is what we expect from you. We're trying to do this every day. And you could be like, hey, listen, I'm here. That's what you got from me, bud. You got me until spring training. And um, I'm going to roam the streets. You know? <laughs> you know at the end of the, I can't throw. So we're, I'll go watch a little BP. Maybe you know, hang with the fans, sign some autographs, and call it a day. Yeah. I, I think that's what they want. To, they, they're pushing him because they know how he is because he's an they introvert. His, they know his agent is too, right? Yes. Just checking. There, there's a good battle going on here. So to be continued, we'll see if he shows up. He has nine days to show up to camp. I'd show up on the last – like Manny Ramirez did that one year. I'd show up on the last day. I'd be like, I'm here. It's like 11.59. <clears throat> show up to camp and like take a selfie. I mean, no one's, I came. No one was here. Was, everything with the facility was locked. What do you guys want me to do? See you next year, Naps. Didn't Ricky Henderson do that too? Did he? Oh, uh, Manny. Remember Manny? Like the mandatory report date's like March 15th, and everyone shows up like February 15th. He showed up like March 15th. He's like, <laughs> this is mandatory report day. It's amazing. And still rake. We'll see what happens. All right, let's get to our next guest. So um, we have not one, not two, not three, but four guests joining us next. They are at the University of Texas Law School, and they participated in essentially a competition that has arbitration between what would go down. Wow, this is great. A six shot uh, between a, a player and his camp going up against a team and their camp. So, um, you know what? I'll do it this way. I want you guys to introduce yourselves. And uh, so let's start next to AJ, because I am learning all of you and your names for the first time. So AJ and points their, to the And their side. favorite there team, too. How about their favorite team? <laughs> Introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Favorite team. And then we'll run through a little arbitration talk right now. Go ahead. You're up. Hey, so everyone. So uh, my name is Nick. I'm a third-year law student here at UTexas. And I'm a huge Mets fan. So let's go Mets. <laughs> uh, I'm Ryan Falk. I'm a 2L here. So a year below Nick. Uh, I'm a Rangers fan. So really riding high for like the first time in my life. Hi, I'm Wade Witcher. I'm a second year law student here at the University of Texas, and I'm a Yankees fan, and it's an honor to be here with the Todd father and Kratzy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank I'm Don. You. Oh, yeah. Don almost 3L and a Rangers fan as well. So good, good year for us. And, and right. this group um, from UT, 
took uh, part in the Tulane International Baseball Arbitration Competition. It's really cool. I'm into ARB. I, I, I nerd out on this stuff and the battles. It's basically like a court case with the player going against the team. So uh, I don't know if one of you wants to just kind of like raise your hand and tell us what went down there, but also just give us a little bit of a lowdown on how arbitration works. Because I think most people don't understand, for example, what the judges know and don't know and what actually qualifies as something that would lead to a case getting settled. Yeah, I can I can jump in on that. Um, and we've got some some extra sort of slides or visuals to throw up as our conversation sort of goes on if it gets to that point. Um, basically, when a player reaches a, a certain point in their career, they are eligible to receive more money than they've been paid. Um, a lot of the times these guys have been paid like the minimum league salary. They could be a two time all star. They could be a Golden Glove winner, whatever, and still be making 700 grand a year. Um, so arbitration is really their first chance to prove not just to their team, but to the world what they're worth. Um, and so the, the collective bargaining agreement with the MLB and the Players Association sets out these six factors that an arbitrator can, can uh, consider. We've got them up on the screen, but things like the how the player performed in their most recent year, if the team's doing well, if they've got a history of injuries. Um, and then really the, the big one that it all comes back to is the sixth one, the comparative sa uh, salaries of other MLB players. So in the arbitration um, setting, your job is to convince the judge, the arbitrator, whoever's overseeing it, that your player is worth what these other players are and not what the lower paid group is or vice versa. You want to prove that you belong with one group, not another. Um, and so that really lays the framework for how we go about it. And it's tough because a lot of the time the arbitrator doesn't know baseball. They're just a normal lawyer or legal fanatic. And so if you want to use a stat to make your case. If you want to talk about war and how good a player is in that category, you've got to be able to explain to the arbitrator what that actually means. And if you can't explain it well, they, they may just not even care, even if the stat itself is fantastic. Okay, so you guys, I, before we dig deep into this, because I, I want to know, you guys are like, when I went to arbitration, you guys finished second, so you guys are like the Giants to me. Like, because didn't Tulane <laughs> win this? So should we have Tulane on instead of you guys? Because you guys <laughs> lost your case, didn't you? <laughs> Uh, we won most of them. We, so we went. We competed in seven, and we won six of them. So it, it was just oh, that. So fun. Tulane won all seven. So if I want, no, if won, I go back to arbitration, I'm calling not. Tulane. No, Vill no Villanova. <laughs> oh, Villanova won. No, nope. yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. never mind. Well, gosh, that's too close to Pennsylvania, though. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you, you don't in want that. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> all it right, went so, all blurry once you said I know, that. Once you start you talking about that. Bobbied them. They hey, go, uh, if you're not first, you're <laughs> last. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I got the, got the camera switched so, now. No, but my, on a serious note, like, are all the all the cases for arbitration, are they finished for this year? Are they all done uh, this year? No, I believe know? they go. You guys just file and trial like teams do now? <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, what it's going to be going up until the end of February, I believe, is whenever all of the all of the cases will be resolved. I know there's at least one going on today. Uh, Rose came in yesterday. yesterday. Yeah, so it's still going on. I mean, most of those people are getting up to like the deadlines, and so hopefully they are pushing settlements so it's get a more accurate market value. Um, Who okay. was your guys' main case? Right, it was Adolis Garcia this year. Was. That was the yeah. big one for you guys, right? Let's and, dig into that. And, and I want to dig into this because he settled before. For people that don't know, that means he settled before he actually went to the actual case. So what was your guys' argument? I'm assuming you were arguing for the player. Or were you arguing against them? So, so we, we actually did both. Yeah. We had to prep for oh. both sides. And so uh, we kind of divvied it up like that. Um, so I'll let these guys take it away for player side. Wait, who was, uh, who was the player side and who was the – so we know who we like and who we don't like? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did player side, Nick did team side, and then Wade and Orange was our rebuttal guy for both sides. So he was sort of our, our double agent. And then Don was our, our fearless coach. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so for our, our, the player side arguments, we, we went with a, a power matters approach. Um, what made it really difficult was Kyle Tucker um, being in the market, who has the exact same awards, the exact same career trajectory just one year ago and lost his arbitration case. Um, so the player side, they were driving at home. Adelise Garcia is Kyle Tucker. They're the same guy. Um, our, we had to find something that distinguished them. And for us, that was that was power. Um, so Aaron Judge really was able to give us a good a good comparison, especially when it comes to postseason, because that's what that's what Garcia is known for at this point. Right. The postseason MVP for the reigning World Series champions. So that, that was really our approach. Um, we kind of had to finagle a little bit, but it, it was cool. 
That's uh, very interesting. I, and then you got Pete Alonzo up there. I know, uh, my oh man, big is that Nick up there, right? Is that who it is? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Big. So when you're comparing – so my question would be, you know, besides this case, Alonzo almost, you know, had a case to an arbitration. Would you have liked to do something like that? And who would you compare his to? Alonzo? I mean, <laughs> I would have to have the numbers in front of us because the thing that we were doing, which was made it a little bit more – Inter <laughs> uh, made a little more interesting was that we had a limited universe of facts that we had to work with. And so they gave, basically gave us a list of players and a list of stats that we could use to compare. And that's sort of what we were working with. In the real world, a lot of times you can do whatever you want. And the, the biggest thing is that it's going to be informed by what's happening right now. And so the later in the arbitration season it gets, the more of a current market you're going to be able to compare to. So with Alonzo, look, I mean, as a Mets fan, my my goal right now is just get this guy to resign ASAP. And we all know how Boris works. So like, let's do it as, as soon as we can do it. Hey, so there's a lot of interesting parts of the way arbitration works that we can point out first off that I learned from your slides too. It's not about projecting in the future, which is what most front offices do for free agent cases. You're just looking at the past to make your case. Um, for example, one thing that stood out to me was the, the mental component that's in that checklist. So John in the chat just said, like, what does that mean? And how does a player lose a case on that? Can you explain? We actually have a funny story from a different case <laughs> about Justin Steele with oh, the coach coming uh, out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the team side tries to find things on the mental component um, that are more like, you know, kind of poor baseball decisions or um, that's like off the field issues with things like that. Um, most of the time, I wouldn't say it's a huge factor. The biggest factor seems to be like Ryan brought up their comparison to other players and their platform here. The year directly preceding arbitration. And so um, if you have a guy that's, you know, constantly, you know, having fights with his teammates or his manager or something like that, that might come into play. But, you know, that's really not the case. Most of the time, most of the time, it's, is this guy Kyle Tucker? Is this guy Aaron Judge? It's, yeah. it's very rare that, uh, you know, anything has really changed on, on mental defects. It's more physical defects. So, you know, I'm sure Marlon's side really hammered home Chisholm's injuries, which is one of the players we had to do for this, this round. Um, but yeah, I mean, kind of the biggest things are length and consistency, platform year, and that comparable player market. Yeah, and on that too, I mean, one of the harder parts is I'm sure AJ, you can speak to this, but I mean, in a lot of these, the player is in the room. And so it's going to be tough for the club side to go up there and try to argue this guy has a mental defect and a physical defect, and that's why we want to pay him less. So it was easy for them to argue that with me. They just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, that made me more money. Thank you guys. <laughs> I, well, I, I, my, my, so I, I'm the only one in, that here that actually went through the actual arbitration process, the whole crap. And they never got really personal, but see, I was fortunate. I got traded before I went to arbitration. So I was up for arbitration. I got traded to a new, so I didn't really know the organization. I went to the giants. I didn't really know them. But going through the process, they were not – I think they've changed now. Now I think they're file and trial. So so my whole thing is, like, can you explain what that means to people out there? Because what happens now is you give numbers. Like, I, if I say – if I'm Todd's lawyer, his agent, I say, Todd's worth five. And the team comes back and says, well, he's worth three. And then you're like, okay, we can get to four. And, and if you don't get to four, then you go to – and as soon as you file those numbers, the team is like, okay, guess what? We're going, right? So – can you explain kind of from the beginning and then where it gets to and then how the arbitrator decides who's going to make their final decision? Yes. So um, the way that baseball arbitration can actually be really unique here is that the arbitrator, A, is not going to give a written opinion. So you're not going to get any facts based on like, you know, what actually made the decision for them. But the other thing that makes it unique is that there's no splitting the difference. There's no, you know, this side filed at three, this side filed at five. Why don't we just settle at four? You really have to pick which one is the more reasonable salary. And that's what the player is going to get which it, the impact it has is on one end, you're going to have, you're forcing both sides to kind of try to come up with more reasonable numbers because if you just come out of left field where everyone feels like this guy's hovering somewhere around three or 4 million and the club side says we want to pay him 500K, there's no chance that they're going to win that. Um, so they have to kind of bring it a little bit closer to the table. But the other thing is in the actual arbitration process, it starts to become more of a battle of the midpoint um, because really what's going to happen is if you can make the argument 
that between three and five million, this player is worth exactly one dollar more than four. The arbitrator has to award them five. And so it really just becomes about, you know, the filing numbers become less important. And it's really what is in the middle and how can you show that closer to your side is even a smidge better than closer to the other. And it's really difficult to even argue that fully because you've only got an hour. You sit down in front of this arbitrator and you've got 60 minutes to, to make your case. The other side will make theirs. And then you can come in for like a quick rebuttal. You can say, here's what they told you that's wrong, whatever. But it, it's very, very fast paced. In, in a real trial in what we're going to do outside of sports stuff, this could take weeks or months to argue in front of a jury or a judge. And you've got depositions and witnesses and just everything in the world. Here, you've got to pick your absolute best argument, push it full steam ahead for 60 minutes, and then really hope for the best. It's, it's kind of cutthroat. And just one more thing on that, like, I mean, Kyle Tucker last year, you know, he lost and gets a $5 million value, but who's to say that's not 6 million, 6.125, you know, now you've got this gray area because you don't have an opinion and now you have this precedent. So whenever people are comparing to at least to Kyle Tucker, they're saying, okay, he's a $5 million guy. And it's like, okay, well, you know, I, I know that's what he got, but you know, what's he, what's he actually worth? Because we have this kind of gray area in between the midpoint there. You're talking to a human. You're talking to an arbiter who's a human. We've established the fact that there's not, they don't there's know three baseball. Of them. Three there's of them? Three. There's three. three. Okay. Yeah, there's three non baseball people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not, not one, there's three of them. <laughs> so is it better to go first? Like, these are humans. Like, if the last thing you hear is all the negative about AJ, his personality, the fact that he can't do this, he can't do that, is it? Better to go first? Is this whole process broken because there's no real rebuttal except for that quick five-minute rebuttal? So it, not in our competition, but I believe in, a, in you know, real life. Um, you get – it's the case in chief for the player, then case in chief club, then uh, rebuttal player, rebuttal club, and then there's a little three-minute, like, sir rebuttal for the player. So you kind of get the last little word in. Uh, but but it is interesting because, you know, kind of in this form, the last real word goes to the club side, whereas in the regular court system, the plaintiff, the person trying to make their case, they get the last word uh, to kind of kind of make their last point. And it's it's kind of a tough balancing act because somebody has to have that last word. Um, and, you know, there's only so much you can do in that server rebuttal kind of point. So, And then one of the downsides of going first, honestly, is the fact that, as you guys pointed out, you are not dealing with baseball people. You are dealing with labor arbitrators. You are dealing with people that just don't really know this stuff that well. So a lot of the time you're spending, if you're going to try to get into advanced statistics or you're going to try to get into the details, is just trying to explain to them what it is you're talking about. These people don't know what war is. They don't know what WRC plus is. They don't, they don't know these numbers. And... Even more so if you're trying to compare them to other players and, you know, you're talking about something like the eye test where it's like you just take two guys like Adolis Garcia and like a Trey Mancini. And it's like they both just bring wildly different things to the table. But if I can just strip that away and show you a sheet with numbers on it and I'm showing that to somebody who's never seen these two guys play, they don't really know the difference. And so when you're going first, you kind of have to explain all that stuff on the front end. And that might actually take away. Whereas when you're going second, you can kind of just piggyback off of all that intro that the other side did. All right, Wade, I'm putting you on the spot here, brother. You were the guy, you, you were for the team, right? I was on rebuttal for team and player. Okay, so pretend you're, you're rebuttal for team right now, and I'm on Garcia case. Hey, you saw him in the playoffs. The guy dominated through the playoffs. He should be making this certain amount of money. There's no way in heck he shouldn't be making this. To all the home runs he hit, he helped his team dominate through the playoffs to a World Series. You're up. You know, being on team side wasn't my favorite thing, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the thing about Adelise Garcia, I think one of, where you see his weaknesses is in his strikeout numbers. And when you look at um, the power benchmark that has been set in the market, you have guys hitting over 100 home runs throughout the course of their pre-arbitration career, making – what our midpoint was six and a half million. Everyone who was above six and a half million that was a power hitter like Adelise Garcia had gargantuan power numbers. And while his power numbers were better than the guys we felt were below the midpoint, they were not deserving of an above the midpoint salary. 
That's not my opinion, but if I was on the team, that's what I'd have to say is his strikeout numbers. Very good, very um, good, very good. He had a very bad – he didn't have a second year that was commensurate with his rookie and third year, and so it's, it's inconsistency. And I would try and qualify the postseason as like an 18-game stretch that could have happened at any time, and he just okay. got lucky basically. Yeah. I'll, I'll, oh, yeah. I'm going to – I'm going to uh, no, I saw you I, giggling. I'm 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 text I'm texting the dollies right now exactly. What you said. <laughs> uh, oh, bro, I, seriously? oh boy! Uh oh, no. If I can I, tag I in for a second there, games. Um, meaning, I, I, I do have his phone number nothing. though. I, I I could hit him up next time. We'll get him on the show when you're on. That'd be no more way. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can It'll we show like this John? Arbitration, yeah, exactly. Can we show this John Heyman tweet too? So. You know, and yes, there are still cases going on. I know our fans pointed out Alec Bohm's case is actually today with the Phillies. But Heyman goes, Vladdy Jr. off a so-so season, got a bigger raise than Luis Arise following his second straight batting title. Arb continues to make no sense. What do you guys think? If one of you wants to take the reins here, studying this intensively, do you think that it's stupid? And if so, how can we do it? better slash differently. I mean, my vote is let's have people that understand baseball because I just think generally these judges are like, oh, there's 10 cases this year. Let's like have it be 5-5 five, five or 6-4 so that they don't fire us for next year because both sides can fire judges if they feel like they're being too tilted on one side or the other. It's a lot of eyewash in my mind. Yeah, well, so one of the most interesting things, which I think Nick pointed out, is the fact that they don't actually like write down the reason that they – came to the conclusion that they did. It could be any reason in the world that swayed them one way or another, and future people in next year or two years from now can't definitively say, Arias lost because of X, or he would have won if he had this number instead. It's just so out there, but it, there's also just no consistency between the years. So the last couple of years, uh, team side has won about 70% of the cases. Um, the process as a whole, at least up to now, we have felt like, favors the team side. But with where we stand right now in this current cycle, players are up seven to four. Uh, so it, we, we don't know what's caused that shift. It literally could just come down to these arbitrators this year are more player friendly. Uh, so I'm, I'm with you and at least bringing in guys that know baseball. They don't have to be like longtime agents or work for the MLB, but maybe like, did you play baseball in high school? Check yes or no. You know, something to prove that you know <laughs> what you're talking about and are capable of making an eight million dollar decision. What I'm hearing yeah, is, well, is uh, Ryan wants them to know ball. So <laughs> I'll, I'll say this: that means thing. what is there three? There's three cases left. It's seven four. Yeah, sorry guys who are left, you're all losing because those arbiters want to keep their job next year and they want the because the, I think the union is the one. Or not excuse me, the owners are the one that pick the arbiters, not the union. I think the I think is that the, true? I think the owners pick it. So the, that's why the owners always have a slight advantage. I think right like a one and one and then a then a one that they kind of combine on uh, oh, okay which, with strikes yeah we, but uh, it's the same thing you can't appeal it because of the arbitration laws in america and so you're kind of in no written order you can't tell if it's arbitrary and capricious is the standard but uh so you're really kind of stuck and and arbitrators are are exactly like you said they're they're known for historically you know quote unquote splitting the baby they don't want any, either side to be too pissed off, so they're going to find a way to satisfy both parties. Take the take. This is my last one, and maybe AJ has another one, but take the numbers out of it. Take the numbers of sides saying, you know, 60% here, 40% there. My question to you is, is it a good idea to go through arbitration if you're a player or, 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 or a team? So we've actually gotten uh, feedback before from, from some of the judges before that some players kind of know, go in knowing that they're not going to win with their number, but it's a chance for them to put their name and their stats and argue in front of their team so that they can realize their value. I'm not really sure. I mean, you guys would probably know a lot more about that than me, but I mean, hey, it's, it's, a, it's a long deal. It's a, it's a lot of kind of sunk costs. It can have some hurt feelings for sure. I mean, especially whenever, I, you know, we got some feedback on what maybe what clubs are a little bit tougher. But, you know, at, at, at a point, you got to, like, kind of make your stand and be like, no, this is this is what the market should pay me. This is what I'm going to say. And if I die swinging on that hill, it is what it is. It's also in the short term, it's just a bargaining chip. You know, I mean, like, you kind of force the team to come to the table with something that is at least reasonable enough to not get lapped out of a room. And so in that sense, arbitration can kind of be a weapon for the player where 
you know, if, if you just feel like you're getting low balled constantly, just say, well, let's bring this in front of three judges and see, like, is this actually a good offer? It's so funny the way you guys describe it. Because I, listen, until you sit through, like, Todd wants to know is a good idea. You want to know what a team really thinks about you? You sit in that, you sit in that room for those three hours. You find out everything, what they think about you. And like you guys said, I remember there's no precedent. There's no written thing. You literally get a phone call from, I got it, it comes from the Player Association. You won or you lost. And mine came and we won. And it was like a big party, but the guys I know lost them. Got, and, then, and then the teams are like, oh, no hard feelings. You're like, bullshit, dude. You just <laughs> trashed me for three hours. No, I just, yeah. I'm sitting five feet away from the GM and he's just, their team, they don't say anything. I was, I actually spoke in mine and I got lucky because one of the arbiters was from my hometown. So before I was like, hey, you're from, uh, <laughs> You know, I'm from there too. You know, let's not forget about, you know, hometown. Grease them, grease them up. I got a, I got a up. tip. Of course. Someone told me that they were told to bring, I don't know, it was a family. Andy. I think it was family, they said. Kids. Lollipops. Kids. Hey, my, my two and four year old are here. It's big corporation fighting me over a few hundred grand, and I'm a first year ARB guy. Love it. Love yeah. it. Listen, whatever it takes, man. These, are, these hearings are nasty. You guys kind of went through it. But, like, if you guys go on and, and work in this world, like, you guys are going to have to sit there depending on what side you're on. If you're on the player side, obviously, you have kind of an uphill battle. But if you're on the owner's side, you have to sit there and you have to look at the player who's sitting there like – I'm sitting there like this. And you guys are, you know, five feet away from me and you're telling me why I suck at baseball. And I'm looking at you going, hey, nerd, you never played anything. So <laughs> what do you even know, right? So it's just, it's just such an awkward experience. And, and, listen, I hope every player gets a long-term deal. They don't have to go through it. But – if you want to know, man, sit there and go through that go through that process and then get back to me. And you don't think it's a business before, you will when it's done. And if you're working for the team and, and you're working for someone who goes like this <coughs> and 500K comes out, <laughs> that's that's a billionaire. So some of these players are not rich. I will say that too. Some are obviously stupid rich. Some players are not rich. Like they have been making um, nothing in the minors for five, six years. Then you're on league minimum. They're not loaded. And then after their career ends, which could be at any moment, you know, if you're like a reliever and you make it four years and this is your one year in ARB to make a couple million bucks, this is your freaking life. So anyway, guys, this was awesome. Really By the appreciate way, if, it. I, if I ever go to arbitration, I'm calling Villanova. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> you're actually helping Kratzy out there, man. Kratzy, you should be proud of that comment. Yeah, I know. But that's just what we do up here in PA. Nova's legit. But so yeah. is UT. Yeah. You guys rock. This was really fun. Appreciate it. Hope you guys had fun. Thank you very much for the time. We'll post all this stuff. All right. Yeah. yeah thanks, thanks, thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Go TCU. Cheers, guys. <laughs> Last thing I'll say too. I just want to get like one more, <laughs> one more thought. Hey, in there. Jay, can I can I say something? Yeah. Yeah. When you went in arbitration. <laughs> Sorry, I'm goofy over here. Did they bring up anything about you fighting uh, the guy at home plate? Barrett? No, that was that happened after. So no. Oh, bro, did they no, bring no, anything they, like? Oh, actually, yo, this I got guy's lucky. A pain in the ass. You guys are pain. They would have brought things up to me, like, oh, oh man, he, he fought Adam Eaton back in the day or something. That, that's what they would have said to me. The, my famous thing that I bring up is is when I was doing when I was sitting in the room and they's like, don't react. So you're sitting there and you're just like, and you're trying not to get mad. And you're trying not, and you're, you're just, you're like, they're lying. This isn't oh, true. This, this isn't true. And, and the thing they brought up, they said, well, one of the things I had like four pass balls that year. And they're like, well, Jason Veritek only had three pass balls. And he catches <laughs> Tim Wakefield, the knuckleballer. And I'm like, I literally grab my agent. And no, he doesn't. Next and I'm he, like, doesn't. he doesn't catch him. It's Mirabelli. And he's like, just, just, just stop. And then that was like one of their big arguments. Did like, you guys rebut that? We didn't even, it was such a stupid argument. We couldn't even. But you have to. But my do guy that. did say something. My the guy because my your agent. I talked. My agent talked, and then the players association has a couple guys that are in there too. Michael Weiner before he passed away was in there, and so and, and my mine was a big. I actually went last in my year because I actually got the highest salary for a catcher first year arbitration ever in arbitration. So and when I won, it, it set like a new standard, right? So Michael Weiner was like, "Your case is super important. We're putting all our eggs into your case." And then when they won, it was like a big deal because they were super because it raised the bar. I like by like a million. I went from like the low, the highest had been two five, and I got three five, and that was like the biggest payday for a first year arb catcher of all time. I mean, twenty years ago. Sure. So, but it was a big deal. So the union really wanted to win that. And they're like, we're going to have yours last. We put the biggest cases at the level. We're like, you're going last. And I was like, oh god, I hope I win. I'm glad like, you spoke too. That oh, yeah. resonates for me. I mean, if you can speak. 
you should speak. That has to play a little bit of a factor. Yeah. It also shows that you can speak. Like this dude is contributing the mental components. He probably gets up and he can speak in front of his teammates too. If I'm a dumb arbiter that's never watched a baseball game in my life. Well, no, they just had me walk through my day. And what a catcher does more than an, and, and you know this, Kratz, a catcher does has to do more than a regular position player because we have to prepare for pitching and hitting, mm -hmm. right? And then defense and everything, you know, that comes along with it. So they just wanted me to be like, hey, explain to why catching is harder. Because one of the arguments for the team is always, well, the catchers don't play as much. Well, why not? <laughs> so then you have to explain, well, listen, I get hit in the shoulder and the face and the balls and the shin. Oh, yeah. And by the way, yeah, you can't play every – I mean, mm -hmm. you know. So it just it, – it, it's a fascinating – I'm so happy we had those guys on. I know I was giving them shit, but, they, I mean, it's pretty awesome. They get to see this, and I hope I hope people pay attention to it. And, again, if you're a player and you want to know, go. Go, because you will find out real quick if the team likes you. Mm -hmm. I just have one line uh, complaint. Adolis Garcia is still an ARB at age 31. He's in the mm -hmm. same process of ARB as Jazz Chisholm at 26. 31 wow. years old, you have multiple years left of ARB? Yeah, that's I mean, got he came change. over from Cuba later. I understand, but still, that's ridiculous. I mean, especially the way that teams value decline in your 30s. 30, yeah. you're, you're getting into your 30s and you still have to go through ARB? No, mm. I'm out on that. There's got to be a limit. What? I was 38. Were you really <laughs> 38 for ARB? I mean, you, I didn't, you didn't... You didn't I didn't file, go to arbitration, did but I didn't collect enough service time until I was 38, and then they kept me on the roster... The rooster. That is insane. Our so needs wait, to so stop they, at 30. So they didn't de they didn't uh, non-tender you? They actually – and then you settled, obviously, because you didn't go. Right. Yeah, I mean, it was it was just a formality. We were so close on the number, it wasn't even really, mm -hmm. can I get this? No. Well, how about this? Perfect. Easy. Can I get a showroom on the, on the road? Ooh, no. hey. Hey. All right, let's bring in our next guest. Ryan Helsley, closer of the St. Louis Cardinals, joining us right now. Ryan, great to see you as always, dude. Um, can I just throw this out? There's my personal complaint. When you're 30, you don't have to deal with ARB anymore if you don't have to. Does that sound good? We'll just get the owners and the players together. They'll settle that and we'll move on so that Adolis Garcia doesn't have to be like basically MVP of October and still go through this shit in his 30s? Yeah. So what's your solution? You're just automatically a free agent? How, how do you go about that? Yeah. At 30. At 30. It, you're done with the whole team control shit. By 30? Kratz, you, you disagree? I mean, that's saying you, you get drafted at 21, you okay. get called up to the big leagues in your first three years, and you never get sent back down. Like, the math doesn't quite work out. Maybe 32, but the math doesn't work out. Like, there's dudes, mm. once you make the big leagues, it essentially, unless you are a superstar, it essentially takes you nine years to reach free agency because you have three years of options and they'll they'll suppress your service time. I'm not saying for everybody. I'm saying for the majority of players, it is really difficult to even make it to free agency. Okay, but I don't think, Ryan, it should be the same for all ages. So I just think there should be a cutoff eventually. If the game is so predicated on your age nowadays, I just think the years that we're talking about with – service time, the league minimum, then the ARB, then you get to free agency should change based on your age because that's how the whole game is looked at, right? We even are going over prospects where international prospects are highly valued if they're really good at 15, but if they're 19, they're like, nah, you're old news. You're, you're not that good anymore. You know what I'm saying? So age means everything. That's how I would do it in a perfect world for the game. I know that's not how it works. Yeah, I mean, that'd be nice as a player sitting here, you know, to get paid earlier and not have to get six full years of service time, you know, it feels like it's forever and the team has control for a really long time. You know, I'll be, I think, 31. I'll turn 31 this season. I'd hit for agency, you know, so a little older than probably ideal for most people. But, uh, I mean, yeah, that's just the way we're at right now. We just had four dudes that were doing like a mock arbitration case. So that's why we're really talking about this. How did yours work this year? Because you didn't go to free, you didn't go to arbitration this year. You have four years and a hundred and however many days of service. You are coming up to the non-tender deadline, which I think is like something in November. Did they approach you before that? Did they wait and tender you a contract and then you guys negotiate? How did that process work for you? Yeah, I think it was basically just like, yes, we're going to tender your contract. There was never any numbers thrown out in November. And then 
basically they waited until the exchange week, whatever the dates were on a Monday and started talking and kind of got closer each day, Tuesday and Wednesday. And then Thursday at noon, I think was the deadline. And, um, there was never really any talk. They felt like we were going to go to a courtroom. They felt like there's, um, some good middle ground we could meet at. And they felt like it was a good deal for us and both sides. I think we're happy with it. Yeah, it, it, it's hard, man. Now, we, we've been talking about this all day. Arbitration is not fun. It's not cool waiting, going back and forth instead of, you know, when I did it, we I'm like, why don't we just meet in the middle? And eventually it did it that way. But I want to switch gears here a little bit. Um, I see you rocking a Nike shirt. Looks fresh on you right there. Looks comfortable, no? Yeah, it's nice. I, uh, all right, how about, merch, how, so. about, how about those Nike uniforms, kid? How, how are those feeling on you? <laughs> they... They feel okay, like wearing them. I think looks they missed a little bit, um, but they, <laughs> the the pants the pants definitely feel different too than last year. It's hard to explain. I've only worn them like two days. You know, need to get a couple more days out there in them and wore the jersey for the first time today. Um, but they're different. I think they feel okay. I think looks could be changed. Hey, what? Okay, so explain that because everything I've seen is. The red is a little bit different, and the Cardinals are big on their certain color red, right? The, the letters of the, your name are definitely smaller than what they were. And then one of the things the Cardinals were famous for was, like, the way they stitched the name. Remember, they, they have, like, the stitching that's all connected, and that's all gone now. So other – I mean, or other people – I know Michael has came out and kind of complained about it, but is anyone else really – saying anything or is this just being blown way out of proportion because to me the way you felt was kind of like the most important thing right yeah it definitely feels different i know a couple guys were talking about how like in the armpits there's not as much room like they feel more restricted um so i know that's is that lance that is that lance is that lance and <laughs> that i've heard a couple times uh guys <laughs> that they don't like the way it fits there um but yeah the looks are weird the stitching definitely looks different compared to last year um so yeah i don't i don't know where they went or what were they trying to do with that but i know in years past you know you try to get a player to sign a jersey ours were like the most expensive by far because like you said they really pay attention to stitching and everything's hand stitched and it looks a little different this year i want you to dive in a little bit on this because in my opinion you know whether the jersey feels comfortable or not i i think you can get away with that okay in my opinion but if the pants can't be stitched to the way you like them, especially as a pitcher, especially as a guy who's fast runner, I think that's a problem. And, you know, back in the day, Eric, you brought – or um, AJ, you brought it up and said, listen, those guys come in and they could stitch you from your hip to your thigh to your knee to your calf and to your, your foot to your liking. I feel like that is the big miss in my opinion because jerseys – there was complaints when Majestic had theirs back in the day and then everybody didn't talk about it anymore. But if you're not comfortable within your legs, I feel like that's a big problem. Yeah, I mean, that's your foundation. That's where everything starts. You know, if you don't feel how you need to feel down there, it's going to throw everything out of whack from the get-go. And I think they're going to have to make a lot of alterations to a lot of people's uniforms this year to get them how they want them. And uh, I'm a pretty simple person. You know, I think I can make it work. Um, like I said so far, I don't think it's been too bad, though. Are you a tight pants guy or a loose pants guy? Probably somewhere in the middle. I don't think they're too tight, but definitely not baggy. So, because then that means the, the fit is even more important to you, right? Because if they're not, if they're too tight, you're going to be like, man, my butt doesn't look just right. And if they're too loose, you're like, man, I can't even see my butt. So, I mean, that's even more important, the cut of the pants. Yeah, they the I got the same size and measurements and everything. The pants, the waist feels bigger, but like the legs feel a little smaller. I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe they changed material or something, but definitely – Maybe you lost weight in your stomach and put weight on in your thighs, and you're going to throw 170. Maybe. That, that, that could have been a possibility. Maybe I just had a really good offer. We'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> you're in the best shape of your life. Best shape of his <laughs> life. <laughs> I like that. See, I'm, ex I'm, I'm actually excited because I wore my shirt baggy. If we're going to bring baggy back, I'm like, all right, here we go. I, I looked at pants yesterday. I got to be honest with you. I have some old pants that, you know, we had a long story. We had eight inches of water in our basement. So I was looking at the pants. And I'm like, how the hell did I get these freaking things on? So they were the size of my body. I'm like, dude, what was I really thinking? But dude, I, I like them baggy, just like the suits back in the day. I like them baggy. That's just my perspective. You yeah, think I feel like styles change for sure. You know, I, 
I yeah. was thinking that the other day. I saw an old high school video of me playing basketball in the shorts we wore eight years ago. You know, it's like, what are we doing? And we thought we looked good back then. You know, it just <laughs> and changed. and now they're 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 Larry Bird type with leggings yeah. underneath. That I, oh man, I got I got nine year old basketball team that have the one legging going down, and the other is just wide open skin. I'm like, where where did this come from? But okay, yeah. hey, teach its own. Are baseball players do they complain too much? I, I always felt like <laughs> baseball players were like, oh bro, it's so sunny out, man. Oh, I can't handle it. It's so cloudy. Is this just the next thing? Because your boy. Miles came out and said something, and now everyone's like, oh, yeah, Miles is kind of cool. Like, we want to get on this train. Or or is there a legitimate gripe? I think it's more of, like, the picture of the jersey, I guess, the design I think everybody's kind of thrown off about. You know, I saw a tweet about it, and, like, I think just the lettering. They can make them a little bigger. I, I think it could be fine. You know, I think, I think like Todd was saying earlier, everybody's going to get used to the way they feel, you know, and – once you step between the lines, you're not going to be thinking about your pants, you know, unless, you know, something's really wrong with them. You're just out there competing at that point. Unless you rip them, then you'll be thinking about them. <laughs> yeah, when you, you're when you slide into second, you, they might be fixing a lot of pants this year. No, you bend over to get the rosin bag, and all of a sudden you feel the <laughs> – they're on the back because they're too tight. You might be thinking Dude, about Dude, that's, that's what nope. Carlos Estevez said. Cause you know Estevez? Have you ever been around him? He's fucking huge. Mm-hmm. He's like 6'6". Six, six. Yeah, he was He's like ripped. flexing. They said it's it's like pulling and ripping already for him. So if you've got like a little more of like the chiseled custom build and you're big, then it's a problem if you're taking customization away. I feel like customization is important. You know what's funny though is all the guys that have come out positive all have the swoosh on their chest like Ryan does. Correct. (laughs) Trout, Arenado, the guys that have come out positive have been Nike guys for a long, long time. They're not very dumb. Adley, Kenley, Uh, yeah. yeah, All Nike guys. Correct. A- AJ, they, and that, not to sound petty, but they got to put the sponsor on the sleeve too. Like that's another thing too as well. So if the sleeve is too tight and then you got something kind of on your arm, I mean, hopefully it's on your arm you don't throw with, but still, it's a lot of things going on with these unis this year, baby. Watch out. Ryan, <laughs> there's only one person that can fix this issue if it gets, you know, if it escalates further, which I know it already has. There was a great story today. The, the, League and the PA are, are discussing things because there's been enough complaints. Two words. Chris Sale. <laughs> <laughs> the scissors? What if, he, what if he went through the phrase and was like, I'm not wearing these. I want the old uniforms back. It wasn't Dude. a scissors either, by the way. What? What was it? It was like a machete or something. It was some <laughs> kind of – it was – what's his name's uh, – it was like this big too. He just slicing, slicing it up. Go on. Wait, everyone always thinks it's scissors. Is it not scissors? No, I could have sworn. I was right there. If I'm wrong on this, I'm going to feel terrible. But I thought he went down on the jersey. He would hold it, and he went down with like a machete or something. I don't know. Damn you it. literally <laughs> saw it with your own eyes, Ty? And, I for, sure? and I forgot. That's you terrible. Sure it, wasn't I, a bo- it wasn't like a box cutter? Like one of those like where he, <laughs> and he just went – like you grabbed – I don't think – was Vinny still there? If anyone's still there, the equipment guy. No, in no. It was Rob, right? See, I, I don't want to sound – it was Rob. And, yeah, I don't want to sound out of place, but I'm looking – maybe maybe it's just my head because it's spinning today. I could have sworn it was like a, like a machete. We're going to have to ask him again. <laughs> He's coming back on soon, so oh, we'll right. get to him. All right. Uh, Ryan, yeah, Ryan, that's what you need to do. If you don't like him, just go in, grab <laughs> grab Ernie's stuff, and just start <laughs> – let me, let, let, me, let me settle this. If Helsley goes – if Helsley goes eight for eight and saves, he's not going to see a single thing about jerseys. If he gives up a couple runs that he's like, I don't understand why I'm giving up runs in spring training, he's going to be going in and getting it customized. Am I right or am I wrong? I really don't think it's going to bother me too much, honestly. I think (laughs) the last thing I'm going to be blaming is the jersey, to be quite honest. Fair, fair. All right, I got a question for you on on a different topic. Do you think that in 2028 players will be in the Olympics as in – Major league players. I don't know if you saw anything about that story, but you know they're trying to make it a thing. So, do you think that it could work? And I can help to inform you if you have any questions. Yeah. The no, league yeah, actually I, seemed I like they. I haven't seen any of that. If, so, what are your thoughts on the way I guess the WBC operates right now? And if you think a week in the middle of the 2028 season, around the All Star break, would work to do a tournament with six to eight countries? It would kind of kick off and be one of the centerpieces of the LA Olympics, right? So it's about a week, mid-July, 
six day countries. WBC could be the qualifiers in 2026. You can have the All Star game maybe in LA because you got the guys there already. If the league wants to still cash in on all of that, maybe reduce the season by a few games. And this would be yeah. another way to kind of show off the sport on an international stage, which Ryan, I'm sure you would agree would be important as we need to kind of keep up with some of the other sports, right? For sure. I mean, I, I mean, I, it's the first time I've heard of it, but I think that'd be great. You know, um, I think we saw how well the WBC did and I forgot what kind of crazy number it was, but when Japan was playing, it was like 95 plus percent of every TV was like glued into yeah. their game. So, I mean, if you get, you know, 10 other countries locked in, you know, and you're affecting that next generation and kids want to play and they're tuning in the games and it's getting views and, you know, you can go on and on. So, I mean, I think if you sacrifice, you know, three or four games in a regular season, then it's not really going to make a difference in any way you look at it. So I think that could definitely be, you know, something really good for the game of baseball on a global scale. Would you do it if it's mid season? Because I'll give an example. Max Scherzer said, He's not in for a WBC. And even, you know, if you go a few years back, because I know he's later stages of his career, but he's like, I would never do that. But if I'm midseason and I'm I'm already hot, I'm in midseason form, I'm good to do a start in July for my country. Yeah, I think so. I think midseason is probably the best way to go about it. You know, I think early in, you know, whenever we're doing the BC in February and stuff, I think it's earlier than guys are used to being at full tilt, so to speak, you know, and then at the end of the season, I guess you could do it then too, but maybe a lot of guys are already kind of checked out and ready to go home with their families that don't make playoffs, you know. Um, so I think I think the middle of the season would be great. You know, you already have everybody in the baseball mood, and um, it's right around the all-star break anyway, so it, I think it, timing-wise it would fit great. Ryan, you're you're in Jupiter. You guys have already reported. You've probably already thrown a couple times. Have you been in the parking lot at all? Have you noticed the rides that have shown up to Cardinals camp this year? And – have you been in Lance Lynn's Bronco yet? I have noticed the cars, but I have not been in his Raptor Bronco yet. I've heard that it's sick and the pink is a great color choice. <laughs> did you what? You made did he make you say that? Did he like threaten to beat you up if you said it was not a nice color no, choice? No, he, he told me the story. It was I'm probably going to get it wrong, but uh he said he bought it and it was the Area 51 blue. And he said he came home, maybe it was after a road trip or traveling somewhere, but he saw his Bronco was pink and he was like, his wife was like, well, the girls wanted it pink. So we got it pink. And, you know, that's, that was that. He didn't really have a say and you know, his daughter's one. And I think he's all right with that. <laughs> epic. That is epic. Got home for the road trip. was like, well, wait, where's my car? They just got it painted pink <laughs> behind his back. That's so good. Talking about Lance. Um, have you seen him throw a bullpen yet? Yeah, we actually both threw a bullpen today. And did and could you hear him cursing, yelling about it? You know, like you hear him yelling at all in bullpen work because he gets after a little bit. Yeah, he was he wasn't too bad yet. I think he's still building up a little bit. I know Sonny was getting after it. You know, I'm, we've never really had anybody quite like Sonny as a vocal and you know just in the moment in the bullpen. You know, you would have thought it was Game Seven or World Series out there the way he was competing on the mound, which was. Yep. really fun to watch you know and when you see a guy like that you kind of check yourself like damn am i taking it as serious as this guy you know like this guy's been as good as he's been for however long and he's out here calling out counts and batters and grunting and spitting and yelling you know and it's three days into camp you know and he's out here treating it like the biggest game of the year what was what was your favorite part of sunny's sunny's bullpen i think just the intent he had you know i think he definitely got better today. I think when, as a player, you always go into stuff trying to get better. You know, I think you waste your time if you're not getting better, whether it's bat and practice or playing catch or whatever. But, you know, I think the intent he had today was really cool to see and, and fun to watch, you know, because a guy like him who's had as much success as he's had, you know, it's it's cool to see the attention to detail that, that he pays. I, I want you – this will be the last thing for me. When you see Steven Matz tomorrow, can you do me a huge favor? And you're going to yeah. be absolutely blown away by this. Like, blown away. Tell him to take a baseball bat. Now, hear me out. So, you know how you hold it like this, right? Now, switch it around. Now, you're holding the barrel, right? Tell him to take that, that barrel and hit his shin. He will hit it as hard as he can with no pain. I want you to videotape it for me and find a way to get it to us. 
I've never seen anything like in my life. He'll take his shin and go, bink, 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 as hard as he can, and he'll <laughs> laugh about it, dude. Please do that for me tomorrow yeah, when you see I'm him. I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm all, all right, thank you. That's all I ask. You're gonna be, you're gonna be like, holy shit! It's amazing. I thought he was gonna say, take the barrel, because he was like, I, yep, turn it around and shove it. And I was like, whoa! whoa, whoa, whoa. I was like, wait, where are we going with this? He's gonna be like, he owes me money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, where is this going here? Grab a bat, don't take, grab a barrel, turn it around, and shove and it up his rear end. He owes yeah. me fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah, I was like, wait a minute. He's getting stuck in the middle of some no, he will stuff think, here. He will go bink, bink with some force, and you'll be like, wow, it's amazing. I can't I, – you have to see with mm. your own eyes. Send it to us. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely Ryan, get that out there. One more since you're in spring training. Uh, when you get your hair cut, does uh, CC cut your hair, CC the trainer? Have you ever had him cut your hair? Yeah, I, I think the last time he cut my hair was 21 maybe. Uh, he hasn't cut it in a while, but he definitely does. He does a good job. Um, yeah, he's good at us. A spot down here that's local and close to the field. Okay, because their trainer's huge about cutting hair. So he'll come in and be like, you need a haircut. And he'll just be like, sit down. And he'll, shoo, 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 cut How your much? Hair. Nothing. He doesn't charge anything. I mean, you give money, but. Yeah. No. CC's okay. cuts, man. You come in there and freaking trim you yeah. up nice. Especially, you know, big night out on the road. He's like, you need, need a fresh, clean cut? Mm -hmm. like, mm, I got five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Five minutes. Wow, he's quick. I'm, I mean, have you seen my mop? It's like, I mean, who yeah. cares? I don't it's, it's easy. Hard. Well, Ryan, dude, we appreciate you. Good to see you, dude. En enjoy uh, camp, and you'll see one of us soon. Maybe you. I All hope so. Guys. I'd love to go to Jupiter. Yeah, I think you will see Pierzynski in person. So if cool. you're feeling bored on, like, I don't know, February 28th, you could see AJ Pierzynski <laughs> for a little spice. Sounds good. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Thanks, you. Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Talk to you soon, dude. All right, so I would like to continue the uniform conversation for a you moment. You just won't let it go. You just want them tight. No, 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 no. <laughs> you, you don't understand, you no, don't you don't understand don't the feedback don't. right now. And did you guys read the story I texted you all today? Yeah, That's I got a couple of stories we were reading about yeah. it. Okay. It's the blame game. It's the blame game. So that's the player perspective because the fan perspective is even more fire. I, I, we've gotten a ton of feedback from fans. Let's go in the weeds. I'll give you one. Um, Horatio. How do you say that name? H-O-R-A-C-I-O. Horatio? Horatio. I, there you go. Well, it was Horatio Ramirez. Horatio. Horatio. Now he said he watched, eyes. and he said he appreciated the, I'm paraphrasing here, the, the player perspective, but he wanted to give the fan perspective that not long ago the jerseys had embroidered names, logos, numbers he said the new jerseys have glued letters and logos Ooh. with sublimated no. team logos on the sleeve he said this probably makes them cheaper to make and increases profit margin but it is a lesser product to the fan and it has seen decline over time and they have increased the price for a replica jersey while lessening the product to try and just help explain why fans are fuming right well, now and i have to imagine they're going to fix this because you're going to lose money when you're younger and I don't know about you guys, when we bought jerseys or shorts or, you know, star, starter, not starter jacks, just jerseys and shorts, whether it was any sport, if it wasn't hand stitched, the person you go into school and be like, yo, you're rocking a fake dog. I'm like, yeah, dude, shoot. You want the hand stitch. The glue ain't going to do it. And I think what people need to understand is, you know, people are coming out and, and blaming like fanatics for this. They're the ones that just say, all right, here. They're the one waiting for the product to get there. So Nike makes the product. So I, I, you know, it's tough to blame both. But if you had to blame somebody, it had to be Nike because they're no, the ones that can't, no, yes. Reverse it, reverse it. People are saying Nike just kind of puts mm -hmm. their logo on it and designs it, but then it actually gets made at the yeah. factory in Pennsylvania. So they're saying no, reverse it. No, but it, it it gets made there. But Fanatics aren't the one that come up with it. No, right. Nike yeah. comes up with it, but then Fanatics yeah. actually makes it. So yes, they, yes, agreed, agreed. But I, I'll, I'll counter that. I think both are technically liable. You're putting your your name and your logo on something, and the other place is actually producing it, right? Yeah. Two words. Great for Britain. sale. Great for it. <laughs> I thought you were going to say suck. Well, it. we have we have a there's a fan who did a nice Great job, a, a creator who did a nice job explaining this as well. Because I think you guys have gotten the player perspective at this point. Here's a fan on the jerseys. 
This is the reason why everybody's so upset with Nike's new MLB uniforms. Starting this season, Nike and Fanatics are introducing their new Elite Template League Wide and their Limited Template for Fan Replica jerseys. As the new fan jerseys have rolled out this offseason, a lot of people are upset with how they look and feel. On these new jerseys, the MLB logo has strangely been shifted below the collar and the player's name has been shrunk and arched a lot more, making them look a lot like jerseys or kid size jerseys. There's also been a drop in quality with some really rough breaks between some of the word marks, nothing being sewn on, just heat press and a lot of people saying the jersey and patch material look and feel much cheaper. And although you will get sleeve patches and front numbers with these jerseys, they cost an extra $40 compared to the ones from last year. Now that MLB players are starting to return for spring training, some of them are voicing their frustrations on the jerseys too. Miles Michaelis said they don't fit right, another player said that they look cheap, and another said, quote, I don't like them. And from the few photos we've seen so far of players' jerseys, you can definitely understand where they're coming from. Like this Brewers jersey looks rough. As someone who loves baseball jerseys, I gotta be honest, all of this is not not looking great to me, but let me know what you guys think. Good job. You know what? I, I, the one that doesn't, I don't understand is the ML. Why'd they move the MLB logo? Like that, that was kind of in a perfect spot. It's kind of moved down. It was kind of like in the perfect spot with the way the Jersey was kind of hemmed up there with the, the, the stitch around your neck. And it was above that. And that was kind of a good spot. And then you had bigger letters for your name. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, listen, they'll figure it out eventually. Yeah, I, they, they will. It's just, Something to talk about. People are going to have their opinions. They're going to hem and haw left and right like myself. But I, I like the hand stitch, man. I think that goes to show you that is the one jersey. Like, ah, oh, man, look at these. Look at the stitching on this name and the numbers. And why you got to make the last name smaller? That's a, And I don't know. Just a couple little things from what I think. They're going to do what they want. And I'm sure there's going to be meetings about it. But just my opinion. Names should be bigger, brighter. Some jerseys got like this cream color to it instead of white. Like these are the big leagues, big dog. We got, you know, let's look fresh while they do it. Hell yeah. It's 2024. Let's get the threads right. And it's, it's America free speech. Say what, say what you feel. And then that's how change gets made. Right. If no one said yeah. shit in the past 48 hours, nothing would happen, but fans are vocal. Players are vocal. This is good. You should want feedback from everyone. It's going to ultimately, cause I know this is always important make the league more money if they're making a product that people want to buy and that players feel comfortable with because they can either make or break the product, right? If there's so many players complaining, but you fix it, then they're going to come out and say it's awesome. And if they're now saying, oh, look, they made changes. The pants are better. They fixed the the lettering. You're going to sell more jerseys. I don't, I don't think it's that complicated. So I think it's important to point out. I like it. That's why we're covering it. All right, vets, other news. The vets need yeah. to step up and say it. Because dudes like me, we're going down and getting the burlap Wilson jerseys, Wilson and Russell jerseys in the in the bushes yeah. with the pants that are a different color gray than the tops. And these things, they don't even need to hang them in your jersey. I mean, you're, in your locker. They just stand on their own. They're just like stiff, and they're just years of washing. Oh. And, and AJ alluded to this earlier. If you're a Nike guy, they're probably, they're probably hitting them up. Hey, man, can you say something good about these jerseys, whether they, they want to or not? Of course they will. That, that's who they're signed and obligated to be with. So you'll see a lot more guys, and you'll be like, oh, he must be with Nike too. So it's, that, <laughs> that, 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 that's been happening as we speak. Yeah. And some of these dudes are rich enough that they should just say, hey, Dansby Swanson was the one that stood out to me. He kind of played both sides. Like, I know what they're trying to do, make it lighter, all that. I'm cool, but we got to make some other tweaks, so I'm going to talk to them. I'm like, cool. That's cool. You know, like, that's how it should be. AJ's just, a Nike guy. Nike guy. Yeah, just look, but if you were in this case jersey. and you were playing, you would have called them and been like, "Hey, dude, I'm getting a lot of feedback from the players. Can we work on yeah, this?" Look, I mean, look, look, look at that, dude. Be. See where the patches? That's the right spot. The letters are yeah. bigger. Right? I don't know. I mean, Pujols one, I can't see it, but that one, Barry, right here. Yeah, it looks good. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's just it. what we were used to, and they changed it. But that's stitched. I mean, that's hand stitched right there. Dude, this a this a piece of it, it's it's know. threads. What, the, what was the famous line from the commish back in the day? A piece of metal? It's a piece of cloth. They can fix it. They'll figure it out. I hope. So we'll follow it, though. I know it's a big story right now in camp. Also, a story that's not as big, but we want to point out with the players, is that they had a little conference call, I believe, with the managers to go over rules, specifically one that they want to enforce a little bit more, and that's obstruction. So I'm going to let you guys take it away on this obviously because we got the players but will we see a little more enforcement at second and third base with the players dropping the leg down if 
they don't even have the baseball. Here it is from our guy, Jesse Rogers. The league is cracking down on obstruction by infielders around the bases, mostly second and third. And they had a little Zoom call with it, um, with the managers about it. Well, I want to know what it means. Like, can they not drop their knee? Like, if you're at second or third when guys sliding in, can they not drop their knee? Right? Because Do they have the ball or no? I don't, I mean, I don't know. If they don't have the ball, that's the problem right now is you don't even have the ball. You're dropping the knee to try and block the guy. It's leading to ankle and what dude, wrist or hand dude, you injuries. You go in spikes first. I guarantee you. But they, they don't do that as much. Anymore. I know. That's what I'm saying. They all wear oven mitts and they all slide in and they are all trying to get underneath like their shin. You go in feet first and you spike the crap out of a dude. Guess what? Next time he ain't doing, he ain't dropping his leg. But they're saying him. that's not happening as much. So let's enforce it. And what they'll do is say, Hey, you dropped. Your leg down and Kratz helped me out. I should not be the one explaining this. But um, if you drop your leg down and you don't even have the baseball, then the dude's safe. Stop doing that. I mean, it's never it's never going to be called unless you set parameters because that is a bang, bang play. We're not sitting there going, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not standing in the way of the base. It's just a simultaneous, you put your leg down. It's actually, it's part of timing. And that was my issue when they first came out with the rules at home plate. Part of my timing was when my knee goes down in front of home plate. Like you can't just sit there and not put something in the way and just give the guy a clean path. And so they say, okay, if you don't put your leg down, like a second baseman will put his leg down. Chase Utley always did it. He didn't care if somebody came in and spiked him. Players would get pissed. Oh, you're going to break my wrist. You know, slide in feet first. Are oh, you going to break my ankle? All this stuff. There's ways to take care of it, but you put your cleat in the way. Is that obstruction? Like they have to, they have to make sure they get this right because every time they come up with new rules, there's just so much gray area because they're not, they're not making it applicable. I, I think you make a good point. I, I can only go by example. And for me, uh, I remember like it was yesterday and this happened twice, actually at third base, bang, bang play. I used to put my foot, down on one end of the base and my knee down. So I try and block it with my shin. And lo and behold, one guy came in feet first, went right into my foot. I held the tag on because he kind of jumped up, got the guy out. I was wobbling left and right. And I go back, I take my cleat off, and my whole nail was off my big toe. So listen, if, if you want to do it, good luck. But if they're cracking down on these things, okay. It's another another thing that's going to ha- another problem that's going to happen in Major League Baseball where it's been going on for since baseball started. So I I see what they're trying to do. I think they should do more not on those. I think obstruction of guys running. So say a ground ball to left field, runner on second, I'm on third. I got to come up and be the cutoff. That never gets called. Like I come whoop, I have to slip out of the way and now he has to go left or right. It, that that call to me rarely never gets called. So I feel like that should be more important than those kind of calls because you could take care of that on the field. Hey, man, look at my, look at my pants. This guy just, you know, ripped me up. Somebody, a little chin music here or something. What, whatever you have to do. But you don't see many of the calls of the one I just said. True. Todd, I have a question for you. You played third base, and I don't know if Kratz ever saw this, but there was a guy I played with, and he – I don't know where he got this from. He, we taught this when I was a twin coming up or what. But there was a – like say there was a fly ball and the guy was on third. He would intentionally stand to where the guy couldn't see – the runner couldn't see where the ball so he couldn't time, yep. like, when he was leaving. And there would be dudes that would be like, get the fuck – like, some guy, I forget, someone tried on me, and I literally was like, get the fuck out of my way. So so what I would do, AJ, I would – ball hit, and I'm looking. Now I'm looking where he's at. So say it's center field. As the ball's coming down, I would inch my way up, and I would jump knowing where his eyes would be. I'd be like – Come on, you got this. Like pretending that I was excited. And it would, you know, so whether it would help a second or not, I tried every which way I could do it. Because if you got close to him, you know, those veteran umpires would call it. But, yeah, I would jump as high as I can. I'm like, you got this. Like just something silly that would make it seem like I wasn't trying to impede his his eyes. But, uh, man, all these tricks, it, it's – are they going to crack down on that? Like there's three or four different examples you can do. So is it just – this or is it going to be a whole bunch of things Can't. they're usually interfering for injuries that's the thing and there's players getting hurt on some of these when? leg drop downs yeah. no Kratz? i mean people talk about oh you could hurt me okay who who okay. got who got hurt because 
you know, especially when you throw out guys' names that are still playing, like, oh, Bryson Stott was somebody that was brought up. Like, all of a sudden, like, is Bryson Stott a dirty player? No, like, you can't – and you can't expect – to me, you can't expect an umpire to call this with a naked eye in the moment. They have to be able to take this to replay if they really want to make something out of this. I agree on that. What's with the replay weirdness all the time? Like, that's what came out. It's not reviewable. Why? Who cares? Why can't we review stuff? Everything should be reviewable. I hate the one I absolutely hate. Well, there's two is the drop third strike. Like if a foul ball comes and it hits the dirt or not, and the catcher, you guys used to get, you guys were really good. I I got, I got, and he called out. And then you look at the first base umpire and he's like, I don't know, or he puts the arm up. You can't see that far, bro, whether the ball hits the dirt or not. That's one that drives me crazy. That should be reviewable. Then the other one is whether it's foul or fair. If it's in front of the third base umpire, you can't you can't change it. But if it goes foul or fair behind them, then you could decide and go into review. Why can't you review it whether it goes over the bag or not? There's camera angles there. So just silly things that I wish I could change. I agree. I agree. We'll see what happens. We'll see. Yeah. If someone's going to get the call because you know what happens. Usually this gets talked about. They tell the umps. They do it for like a play or two, and then it fades. That's what happens. You know, Kratz, how many times has this been brought up in our game? I mean, for me, following it for the last couple of decades, something gets brought up. They used to do this. They were trying to police hitters getting into the box. And that's why eventually, you know, you get the pitch clock and all that. Cause the umps were told to police it. Oh, I know. Good luck I got, with that. I got, a, I got a letter or two. <laughs> Your foot left the batter's box, and they should send you a video. And I'm like, well, it's 3-2, bases loaded. Two outs. I called timeout to step out. Sorry, my foot left the line. They're like, they had the overhead, and you're like, look, it was, and they like show it, and it's like one inch outside the box. And I'm like, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I like that's, it. that's how I felt too. <laughs> All right, let's do some bet MGM odds. Let's look at the American League pennant. Now, we bring this up because today we got some news if you want to backtrack earlier in the show once we're done here in a few minutes the Orioles are not going to have Kyle Bradish to start the season I wonder if that affects anything for anyone especially if you're worried about you know his long-term implications with the Orioles in 2024 you know if that eventually does lead to a potential surgery because of the UCL issue so right now the favorite to win the American League the Houston Astros at plus 400 the highest ticket is the Baltimore Orioles, and the highest handle is the Baltimore Orioles. Ticket means how many people are choosing the Orioles to win the pennant. Handle is how much money, so the Orioles are leading the pack there, and then that makes them the biggest liability, a.k.a. if the Orioles win the pennant, Mm -hmm. that would hit the books. That would hit BetMGM the hardest. Thoughts on the American League? Because this goes beyond just picking a division winner. Then this takes you into tournament mode. And that's where I understand Houston getting some love because if they are in the playoffs and they've got their bullpen intact, I'm a fan of what they did. I think that bullpens get more and more important in the playoffs every year with starters going less, right? So if I've got seven, eight, and nine locked up like they do, you got to feel pretty good about the Astros. I can't argue with any of these numbers. (laughs) Yeah. All right, thanks. Cool. No, because and that's <laughs> it for today. No, because no, because Houston's been in the in the LCS what seven years in a row. Ah, they've, been, yeah. they've been in the World Series how many of those times? Five of the seven or Something four like of the that. five of the seven, whatever. They won two. They lost to the Nats and they lost to a couple other ones, but they've been there. So that's why they're the favorite. It's not that they necessarily think they're the best team, but they're their playoff season. They have the experience and they have that bullpen. And they, you know, Verlander and Fromber have done it at the biggest stage. Christian Javier. So. That's why they're the favorite. Not saying they necessarily might be the best team, but people will bet money on them. And then everyone's hot on Baltimore. This is obviously before the Braddish injury. So everyone's hot on Baltimore thinking they're going to take the next step, especially after Corbin Burns. So I see why that's the highest ticket and also the highest money laid because it makes sense. And then the biggest liability. So it, all this makes sense. There's not really much to argue with this. I mean, other than, you know, Kratz or, or Todd want to say, oh, the Yankees need to be up there, but I don't no, know. No, I would say Houston, like you said, but I – in my opinion, I think they're going to be just fine. Even if that's the lie, but I don't think they're going to win the AL pennant, in my opinion. So I think they will be fine. Who do you think is going to be fine? 
No, uh, the uh, bet, uh, No, the the company, the bet MGM. Oh, oh, yeah. You yeah. mean <laughs> they're they're going to be fine regardless? Be just <laughs> no, but, but I'm yeah. saying since they're the liability, I just don't. I don't. I think they have a good shot, but I I I don't see them getting there. You don't see the Orioles getting in. Uh, no, the winning an AL pennant. That's all. Who do you like? I would say Houston, or or the, Rang- or the Rangers, or the Rangers. What about you? Phillies, Yankees, AL. <laughs> he said he was still going to say the Phillies, though. <laughs> Yankees, Brewer, Brewers, Yankees. The, Bre- the Blue Wiz. I love the Blue Wiz. <laughs> and the and yeah, and the Yankees are right there too. So, yep. We'll it's going to come down to the starting rotations. You talk about mm-hmm. bullpens, Yankees bullpen, Astros bullpen, Orioles bullpen is down a little bit because of the fact that they have, you know, they don't have um, Batista this year, but it's going to come down to starting rotation. All the guys that you just mentioned for Houston, the guys with the Yankees with Cole and Rodon, wh- what are they going to do? Is Stroman going to be first half Stroman? And now what happened to the rotation with the Orioles? They're still anchored by, but you, you got to see Grayson Rodriguez step up. Burns, he's going to anchor the staff, but Rodriguez has to step up. So it's going to be come down to the starting rotation because all three of those teams are going to bang. One other thing I want to point out about the Orioles. In the beginning of the show, when we talked about them, there were a few fans that threw a name out there that I have heard of and remembered following last year. And just I didn't realize that he's already 25 years old. The name is Chase McDermott. He was acquired in that Trey Mancini deal. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Came over from mm-hmm. Houston when Baltimore traded him away that off season or that season. And some fans were pissed because they traded him and Jorge Lopez. Mm -hmm. And some fans were like, hey, I think they should compete. But Chase McDermott projects to be at least a back-end starter. Some people think he can be a mid-rotation starter. He's taken significant strides since he came over to Baltimore. He was getting crushed by lefties in 2022. He kind of fixed that. Change up in cutter, keep improving. If, If he, you know, command issues, the usual from pitchers that are still in the minor leagues at that age. But that's the name that we've been told to keep an eye on. So that's fair. Mm-hmm. He might emerge in spring and he could make the team because it's not just Bradish. It's John Means, too. He might not start the season on time. And then you're like, all right, what's the rotation look like to start the year? Burns and Grayson Rodriguez, awesome. I'm freaking pumped. Kramer, okay. Mid to back end guy. Tyler Wells had some nice moments mm-hmm. last year. Means, if he's healthy. But he's I said, healthy. means if he starts yeah. the year late. So, and they can start with a four man in the first, I think, two or three series, yeah. and then you got to. And, and listen, you it. can't say this lightly either. We talked about it earlier. AJ and I have some oblique problems. That shit's for real. I don't care if it's slight. You got to. When I talked to a doctor, I said, hey, listen, what is. I want you to, you know, shoot this. Don't shoot the shit with me. I want you to be honest. Like, how long does an oblique go away? He said, listen, you got to wait 20, I think he said 25 days just for it to kind of subside. And then you could start like working this thing out. So these, they don't go away. I had it three times, bro. It's a pain in the ass. You get it once, it's like, shit, man. So Gunnar Henderson, bro, you, you be very careful here. Yeah. Yeah, right. You're young. You're invincible, but you got to take it easy. You're in camp. I'm with you. All right. So take a look at the bet five, get 150 instantly offer. Place your first bet MGM sportsbook wager through the app of at least five bucks. You'll get $150 instantly in additional winnings, regardless of your wager's outcome. Once you place that bet, at least five bucks at standard odds price, 150 bucks in bonus bets, regardless of the outcome of your wager. Got to use the promo code FOUL, F-O-U-L. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. FoulTerritoryShop.com, if you're in cold places, I know some spots got crushed with snow. Nice hoodies. And a new item coming soon. Should we tell people or should we wait? Tell them tomorrow. Okay, we'll tell you tomorrow. Please subscribe also, it's free. Yes. Even Scott can afford that. Even me, yes. Can't afford taking AJ to dinner though. Uh, By the way, did you see Trevino? He's got the calf. Yeah, but he didn't ride in on a horse, so I guess I'm out on that dinner. 
You are not paying for Trevino's dinner. He's got the calf strain. He's going to be out for a few weeks. Uh, our boy. Kratz hats. Original. Basic raise. Doing it the Ray way. Basic I, raise. Raise up. Do you know my middle name is Brian, so I can actually use that hat. Who? That's my mm, middle there's. name. Is Brian. TB. <laughs> oh, Anyone really? call you TB? Fish don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, um, I don't remember, to be honest with you. Brian with an I or a Y? What do you think? I. I don't think. <laughs> I is right. <laughs> Todd's Todd's parents don't fuck around. They were like, "Nah, we're doing B R I A N." Todd wanted me to be. They wanted me to be a girl. That's the problem. <laughs> what was the they, name? If you were they, girl? Had, they had two boys. They wanted me to be the girl. I don't know. You know what your name would have been? Uh, Roberta. Roberta. I was gonna no, be Sarah. I, I don't know. Fun fact. Kratz hats. You didn't grade it. I mean, it's like a B. It's nah, that's a shot. C for me. C, mm. C. If it was the old Devil Rays, with the, yeah. with the actual Devil Ray in the purple, then that is a badass mm. hat. Mm. But we know. have a show tomorrow and every weekday. Also, stay tuned next week. We're going to have some time tweaks that we'll announce next week for spring training so that we can keep getting players on, as we do on FT. Also, are we announcing travel plans? Soon. Soon. Okay. Wow, we got a lot of announcements. But now keep those uniforms tight and tailored, okay? You Bye. would like those uniforms, Scotty. No, they're not tight enough. <laughs> Painting was a gift, Todd. <laughs>